Five Short Horror Stories for Adults Written by Stories from the Attic Narrated by Robin McConnell The Beast of Elderton In many ways, Elderton was the same as most small Canadian towns. The road into town was also the road out, and along its sides, the town was studded with the sort of small businesses and family-run concerns you'd find anywhere across the country, and in similar-sized towns across North America. There were two diners and a slightly more upmarket place where couples would go when they wanted something a little more fancy, or a guy wanted to impress his girl on a date. There were three or four bars, where the same groups of men hung out every night of the week and were joined by the less committed patrons for the live music most Friday and Saturday nights. We had a gas station, a grocery and hardware store, the police station where Sheriff Beaumont and his deputy Lanny spent most of their time resting their heels and playing poker, and we had a town hall, which was a new building stylized to look like an old one, columns and all, in an attempt to lend the place some gravitas. We had all this and just enough residents to fill the business and make this human ant farm tick over nicely. As I said, Elderton was like most small towns. What made it different was that in addition to all of these things, Elderton also had a werewolf. I remember the first time that I heard that word, werewolf, spoken with honest-to-God seriousness in a town meeting. It was thundered out by Mike Ronston, a local mechanic and a man not unaccustomed to being very vocal in this kind of situation. That night, he stood up and, swiping his red cap from his head dramatically to underline the seriousness of his words, called out the leaders on the stage by using that word like a bludgeoning instrument, forcing forward his point and clearing the way for the sharp end of his ultimatum. I know that nobody wants to say it, but we're all thinking it. It ain't a coincidence that this is the fullest town meeting I can ever remember. Folks are scared. Damn it, I'm scared. Mike gestured towards his heavily pregnant wife, Tina, who was sitting beside him in one of the uncomfortable plastic chairs dragged out for such meetings and cradling her bump in her arms protectively. I got a kid and two more on the way. How am I supposed to sleep at night knowing that they gotta worry about things like werewolves? Whit Meller, the town councillor, raised a hand as if to stop Mike and dismiss this talk of supernatural monsters, but clearly overestimated the power that his raised palm had. Ignoring the hand, Mike simply kept right on, his words like a snowball, gathering mass as they built momentum. Momentum formed from the approving and supportive sounds from the men seated around him, and the muttered agreement from others who were also clearly frightened out of their wits. It ain't no coincidence that this meeting has been called earlier than any other town meeting, that the date is earlier in the month than most to avoid the full moon. We ain't stupid, wit. We know you're thinking the same thing we are, and you just don't want to admit it because it'll go down in the minutes and people in the cities might laugh at you and your redneck hillbilly town for still believing in ghost stories. Thing is, though, we do believe in them. We believe in them because they're real. They're real and they're dangerous, and if you and your band of pen pushers ain't gonna do anything about it, then we damn sure will. At this point, a chorus of cheers went up from behind and around Mike as the other men in the village felt the force of the idea growing. They would take control of the situation. They would make everything okay. Mike was finally saying what they had been thinking for months, and if that involved saying the word werewolf, where everyone could hear it, then so be it. Of course, it had taken someone to be first, for the rest of the town to find their nerve. The word werewolf had been floating around the town for months, but like the creature itself, it was not seen out in the open. Rather, it skulked and lurked in the darker corners, out of sight, whispered in the later hours by those who had seen one too many horror movies, or had sunk one too many beers at Dell's Bar. On those occasions, the word was said with hushed, almost reverential tones, and pronounced with the deadly self-important seriousness only truly achieved by the steadfastly convinced or the seriously drunk. For months, that kind of talk was brushed aside, Nonsense and superstition, people said, but by the time the town meeting rolled around, nonsense and superstition had hardened into cold hard fact and crept by slow degrees to the very top of the agenda. It had started in the spring with the coming of the harvest moon, 
Though it wasn't unusual to hear dogs barking or baying in the wee hours around town, the sound that had come with that moon was like nothing people in town had ever heard before. Some said it was a fox, speaking with suddenly sprouted expertise about how the call of a fox could sound like a child's scream, a point which, though interesting, actually destroyed their argument, because whatever was making that sound was no fox, and the noise sounded nothing like a child. The howl, if you could call it that, was a guttural, curdling thing that seemed somehow to have texture, as if it were ragged or torn at the edges. This, some would say later, was because the vocal apparatus, the machinery through which it was forced, was malformed, just like the thing itself. It was not meant for howling, because in truth it was not meant to exist at all. But it did, and so too did the howling. In a small town, especially up in the mountains, the night brings with it a hush. With all the businesses shut up for the night, people safely locked in their homes, and the streets empty of cars, life in the town simply goes to sleep with the inhabitants. Activity is placed on pause until the next day, and only silence and the odd staggering drunk walks the main road. Usually these spring evenings are fresh and clear in Elderton, the air filled with the scent of pines from the forest that fringes the road out of town and scrambles determinedly up the mountainside. The sky is of a deep ocean blue that shows more warmth than the all-encompassing black we are used to in autumn and winter, as if the sun were waiting just around the corner, anxious to announce its arrival. The temperatures are still low this high up, but spring is both beautiful and vibrant in the daytime, and crisp in a way that feels somehow clean and new in the night. During those few days, however, this atmosphere was shattered. We knew it was only noise. Parents said as much to their frightened children, comforting and reassuring them that it was probably a deer, and that the noise would be gone soon. It wasn't. Instead, it rang out like a clarion call, slicing through the still, chill May air and inserting some of that chill back into the hearts of men. It was a sound that no one in town had heard before, and yet, somehow, in the base, animal depths of our instincts, we all knew what it meant, and that we didn't want to be outside when whatever was making those sounds came padding slowly into town. Looking back now, I remember how a number of men in town, mostly those who occupied bar stools at Dell's, spoke of going out into the woods at the edge of town to investigate. They would talk with nodding concern about how that sound could only be made by an animal in pain, and that the only humane thing to do would be to find it and put a bullet through its skull. Words like these come easy at Dell's, where the beer, like talk, is cheap. The men never did go up to the woods, Something about the way that the sound only came on at night convinced them that it wasn't a trapped animal after all. What if, one or two posited, it was a bear? They'd be happy to go up and shoot whatever poor thing was screaming during the daylight, but if it was a bear making those noises, then hell, only a fool would go up there creeping around in the woods in the dark. That's how you get yourself killed. This, they'd say, deciding as they did that staying put was a far better option. Outside, the howling continued, echoing through the clear mountain air and forcing its way into every home, every bedroom, and every eardrum in town. Dogs barked in response, drunks and shift workers called from their windows, as if adding to the noise was somehow going to make it stop, and oddly, when the moon was no longer full, it did. For twenty-eight days there came no sounds from the forest, but sure enough, when the moon once again showed the fullness of its face, the howls started again. This time, however, it wasn't just a sound. This time, blood was spilled. It started with the dogs. With every baleful howl that reverberated out from the dark between the trees, there came, in response, softer, more familiar howls. The high-pitched calls of dogs joining in chorus with the louder, deeper call. They too had an instinct and it drove them to react. Little did they know that by calling in response, 
they were giving away their location. In the course of three days that June, six dogs, two Alsatians, two golden retrievers, and two mongrels were snatched from gardens and yards. In one case, the chain that had held the dog fast to its kennel had been cleaved right in half. The newspapers said, Bear, and the men reached for their guns. A full two days after the last dog was snatched and three since the howls were last heard, a posse of men armed with shotguns went out into the forest, looking for the dog-eating bear. Around the same time, some of the more imaginative members of the community began reporting their own hair-raising brushes with the creature, all supposedly having seen this mysterious predator up close, and for some reason having waited until this precise moment to relay the story. Eyewitnesses, most of whose eyes were decidedly bleary, reported having caught a glimpse of something huge rummaging in the trash cans, or explained with appropriate levels of melodrama how they had confronted the thing standing on its hind legs and staring in at one of their windows. It is strange to consider now that in a story that so heavily featured a wolf, so many in town were tempted to cry, Bear! Of course, the hunting party found nothing, and the matter again seemed to slip from the forefront of people's minds until a few days before the next full moon. Then, despite the dubious reports of grizzlies and even one of a decidedly lost-sounding polar bear, people's minds turned not to stories of bears, but to wolves. It wasn't the first time these lupine predators had made their presence felt in Elderton, nor would it be the first time that the wolf's larger folkloric cousin made an appearance in the imaginations of the townsfolk. As recently as 1980, a timber wolf, which had obviously become separated from its pack, wandered into town and stole several chickens. It was made short work by the sheriff of the time, but as a near-mythical threat achieved legendary status within the stories of the playground. Further back still, there was a genuine story of a werewolf in the town records, when people less enlightened than ourselves, in our modern confidence, accused a man named Tom Wilbur of transforming each full moon and snatching up children to take away into the forest and consume. The records of births and deaths in the area confirmed that four children had been killed in the month prior to Wilbur's execution. Whether the famed werewolf of Elderton actually had anything to do with these killings, we will never know. But it was certainly the case that Wilbur paid the price for it, and most people in town, who had at one time or another passed the crossroads on the edge of town where Wilbur was buried, knew of the legend. Old towns have long memories, and sometimes ideas that haunted our forefathers come back to haunt us today. Of course, for the majority in town, the idea that a town in the 21st century could be terrorised by such a ridiculous superstition seemed insane. It was the reporter that changed things. More specifically, what happened to her. Muriel Rees was a journalist with a national newspaper and had, for a very brief moment, spent some time in Elderton. Not that she did a story on the place or even on the strange sounds from the forest. Ms. Rees's only contribution to the story was her disappearance. She had not driven out to this remote part of the province to sample the delights of Elderton, but was rather simply passing through on her way to another town, or more likely a city, that had far more to hold her interest. She had stopped off briefly for some lunch in Arne's diner in the early evening, and after filling up her gas tank, had jumped in her car and headed on to wherever it was she was headed on to. She never made it. Early the next morning, her car was found abandoned by the side of the road out of town, right on the edge of the forest. The hood was propped up, suggesting that she had gotten out and had been trying, with the aid of the flashlight found on the tarmac a few feet away, its bulb smashed by the impact, to fix whatever engine trouble she was having. The door to the car was still wide open, and the keys in the ignition, but there was no sign of Muriel, save for a large swathe of fabric torn from her dress and a woollen scarf that she had been wearing earlier that day. Both were found tangled up in the brush where the road met the trees. Both were saturated in blood. It was then that the word werewolf began to once again be banded around far more seriously in Elderton. Back at the town meeting, Whit Miller, from his position on stage, 
was doing his best to calm the room and prevent the fear people were clearly experiencing from developing into anger, particularly anger that could then be directed at him or his colleagues. The matter of Ms. Reese's disappearance is now in federal hands, he declared, using the advantage and false authority given to him by the microphone to call over the rabble. Whilst her disappearance, her murder, a voice from the crowd interrupted and corrected, Wit coughed and paused before continuing regardless. Her disappearance, no murder inquiry has yet been launched. Whilst her disappearance is obviously unfortunate, it is no reason for us to become hysterical and start throwing around stories and ideas that belong on the Saturday night horror specials and not in a town meeting. There was an eruption of protest, but Wit, to his credit, continued on unfazed. Whilst it may have been acceptable for people in this town to succumb to that kind of nonsense 300 years ago, we do not live 300 years ago. We live now, and in this day and age that sort of hysteria has no place, no place at all. No sooner had he finished making this bold proclamation than Mike was back on his feet, shaking off his wife's feeble attempts to grab at him and keep him in his seat. That's all well and good for you, mister, but I'm telling you, I'm telling all of you, I've already melted down two pounds of old silver. I'll have five silver bullet casings ready by the end of the month. The next time something happens in this town that even looks like it could be down to a werewolf, I ain't gonna wait for permission. I'm gonna grab my rifle, head up into those woods, and shoot the darn thing myself. He paused and made a point of looking every man in the room in the eye before he spoke again. If you all have any silver you'd want to contribute or guns you're happy to carry, then you're all welcome to come on with me. There was much nodding and confirmation that if something were to happen, a hunting party would be assembled, though looking at some of the men agreeing, I suspected that at least a few were both hoping that day would never come and happy that the full moon was several days away. When the time did come, when the moon rose to its highest point and lit the empty roads of Elderton, it did not find a soul to fall upon. In the week before the full moon, Merv's hardware store ran out of wooden boards and had to put in a second order from the city as people began, as if preparing for a big storm or a hurricane, to hunker down, boarding windows, nailing closed their storm doors, and buying up enough ammunition to start a small-scale war. Dogs were brought inside the house, livestock brought into barns that were fortified and locked up with barricades, In a few gardens, signs appeared warning that the front lawn was scattered with bear traps, though whether the owners expected to catch a bear or something else in them was debatable. I remember walking through town and watching old Mrs. Peterson, whose house had the dubious distinction of being closest to the edge of town, and therefore to the forest, as she struggled with a piece of two-by-four. She was attempting to nail it to a large board that she intended to affix across her porch screen. I volunteered to help, but she shooed me away, saying that she'd manage, and didn't need no help fixing no stupid board, all whilst shaking her fist and wagging a heavy-looking hammer, in a way that made me suspect that she couldn't manage, and that with one errant flick of her frail-looking wrist, the hammer could fly off and brain me. So I relented, and continued on my way. The next time I saw that hammer, it was lying on Mrs. Peterson's lawn, the screen door, boards, and two-by-four smashed into splinters, and a trail of blood arcing out, slick and red, through the tall grass, curving towards the forest. That night, the howling had taken a long time to come. As soon as the light had begun to fade, people had retreated into their homes, many not even bothering to turn on the TV or look at their phone screens, but instead waiting inside quietly, listening. Many chose not to turn on their lights for fear that it might show that they were home. Others, who had barricaded themselves inside with chairs against the door, sat with firearms loaded by their sides, also listening. The town, however, was silent. Midnight came and went, and there hadn't been a sound, because, of course, the thing was feeding. At 1am we heard it, ringing around the town like an air raid siren, that ragged, half-twisted screech, a low, bestial call of warning and triumph. It had taken one of ours, and it wanted us to know.
The next day, once the sun had firmly risen and thrown its golden rays upon the blanket of snow that had appeared in the night, we saw the mess in Mrs. Peterson's yard. Another town meeting was called, this time in front of the town hall rather than in it. With raised voices, the volume and pitch cranked upward by panic, the inhabitants spoke, speculated, and screamed openly about the werewolf in their midst. One voice, that of Tony Fields, was heard to suggest that a head count be taken at nightfall, that anyone leaving their homes and unaccounted for should be questioned. He held in his hand a ledger in which he proposed to make these notes, and for a moment I wondered if he also proposed to record the hanging of whichever innocent party was accused of transforming. At this point, Mike Ronston scaled the stone steps and began to address the crowd. His wife Tina, once again, ineffectually attempting to hold him back. Mike dismissed Field's suggestion and what he referred to as the intention to turn the whole thing into some kind of whodunit mystery. We don't need to catch the thing like we're playing Cluedo. We don't need to catch it at all. We need to kill it. Shoot it with the bullets I and the fellas have been making and drag the godforsaking thing's carcass back into town and mount its head right here in the town square. A rousing cry went up from the other assembled men. At 5 p.m. tonight, every able-bodied man in this town gathers here. We go up into that forest and we bring back that thing. It was only when the second cry went up from the assembled men that I realized all at once that I would be included within that number and would be expected to venture into that forest later that evening. For a moment, I wondered if there was a way to get out of it, to avoid this involuntary conscription, when my eye caught those of Tony Fields, and I knew at once what would become of any able-bodied man who didn't join them, thereby becoming notably conspicuous by his absence. At ten minutes to five, I found myself standing in the town square, shivering against the cold, and ready to embark on the type of mission I knew, if I survived, I would tell my grandchildren about as they looked at me in disbelief. To say I was nervous would be an understatement. To say I'm proud of what happened, or that I'd want to tell my grandchildren about it, is a damn lie. Walking in a group, with only the sounds of their boots on the tarmac and the soft rustle of fabric as they moved, the group took on a unity, a shoal mentality, driven by the idea that if they moved forwards, each individual forcing the other onward, as a group, they would eventually get there, as a group. It was the epitome of the attitude of safety in numbers. I, however, felt far from safe. As we approached the edge of town, I glanced up past the rising shoulders of the other men and saw the world made up of two elements. The trees, twisting and black against the snow, forming a single line as if they had bled down from the face of the sky and, above it, shining on with pale indifference, the cold, desolate face of the full moon. There was no howling now, just the sounds of boots and the click and metallic thuds of rifles being loaded. My own rifle, which I had only ever fired once to scare away some unidentified critter that had come to our garden, was slung over my shoulder. It felt icy within my grip, and I was equal parts terrified to hold it too firmly and to not hold it firmly enough. Finally, this strange company bar owners, mechanics, grocers and carpenters, a wall of checkered plaid and woolen overcoats, nodded in silent agreement and stepped across the boundary from the world of electric light into the forest. I remember noticing how the ground beneath our feet was frozen solid, how beneath the thin, yielding layers of the snow there was a surface as hard as stone. I remember also thinking that the ground, sharp, hard, and angular was hidden beneath that layer, as whatever was waiting for us was hidden by the trees, a thin, yielding, and familiar layer that made us feel secure, unaware of the raw savagery that lay beneath and behind. After a few moments, during which I purposely jostled to be close to the centre of the group, not to be the one left at the back, nor the one leading the charge at the front, I happened to glance back over my shoulder and saw how the forest, like night itself, had closed in around us. The road had disappeared. To our backs, in the direction of the road, of safety and escape, there was only a wall of black. Suddenly, 
Mike raised his hand, bending it, closed fist at the elbow, in a cactus arm motion that I had seen in action movies but not actually known the meaning of. Everyone stopped. The flashlight beams danced around each other like glow bugs in some mating ritual, catching and showing in strange fragments textures of bark, branches and leaves, gnarled and leaning inward, overlapping. With every splintered image, the mind searched, forming from the shadows, flashes of eyes, teeth and fur in every corner. I thought I saw things. Things with muzzles that dripped hungrily with thick gouts of drool, eyes that watched with animal fury. I felt my breath quickening and had to consciously try to slow it, to convince myself to settle down, but I couldn't. Panic had gripped me. I could feel my muscles losing tension as each tiny step I took, searching the tree line made my entire frame feel as if it were made of water. I turned to my right, bumping shoulders with another man and catching a glimpse of his rifle aimed toward the flashlight beams. I noticed that the end was shaking furiously as he trembled. Not, I knew, from the cold. We stood in a badly formed circle, moving our backs toward each other so that there were no gaps and everyone was facing outward. We searched and scoured the dark, looking for some movement. In some dim, half-formed notion of military formation, this shape seemed a good idea and would stop any individual from being vulnerable. This may have been true facing soldiers of the other side, but in this situation it did the opposite. It made us all vulnerable. With low, rumbling growls and the snap and tear of branches, we heard the thing moving around from one side to the other, over and over. We were now the centre, and it was circling us. My mind flooded with images, woodcuts I'd seen of monstrous beasts, things with swollen, mane-like necks and long, furious muzzles filled with teeth, Monsters from movies, paintings, merged together into a single form, the werewolf that was not only real, but here. Staring along the shaft of my rifle, I pointed it at the darkness, hoping, praying that I would have the speed to pull the trigger before anything could pounce, before I was dragged, screaming into the dark to be mauled, helplessly overwhelmed by a thing of immense strength and insatiable hunger, eventually facing that most basic of human fears, the fear of being consumed. Suddenly, to my left, there was a scream, a flashlight beam tore in a silver arc across my eyeline, and... I saw it. As clear as I see the hand before my face, I saw it. It was huge, at least seven feet tall, but hunched, its mouth a gaping, too wide mass of stabbing fangs, jutting murderously forward. There was a pain as the man to my right slammed into me in an attempt to flee, to run from the beast before him. Then there was a gunshot, an explosion so loud it sounded as if it had gone off inside my head. My hearing took a while to come back, but as I scrambled after the others, sprinting, chasing back towards the road, I told myself over and over that after the sound, the deafening bang of the gunshot, there had been a yelp, a high-pitched screech of pain, buried on the edge of the explosion. Whoever had fired had hit it, hurt it, and now, now we were chasing, now we were the predators chasing the wounded thing out of its lair and back toward the road and the light. As we crashed out onto the tarmac, leaving the forest behind us, each of us stopped dead, the force of the shock hitting us like a wall. Tina! Tina! Mike screamed, half shouting, half crying. Before us on the road, lying pale and naked in a crumpled pile, was Mike Ronston's wife, blood covering her entire torso and steam rising from the hunched curve of her spine into the frigid air. What the hell was she doing up here? I, I thought I hit it. I really thought I hit it. Mike wailed, cradling his pregnant wife's head in his hands as she stared emptily upward, her eyes bulging, gulping air like a fish caught on land. I stepped away from the scene. Had we really done this? Really shot a woman? I asked myself over and over, checking my memories, replaying that moment again and again. No. I had seen it. It wasn't a woman. It was a wolf. I was certain it was a wolf. But now it wasn't. Now it was a woman, 
a woman whose life, along with the lives of her unborn children, was slowly slipping away. Or so we thought. Tina Ronston died on her way to the hospital. An inquiry launched into the death later that year was a confusing mess that did not even reach court. Based on the outlandish nature of the testimonies that were given and the refusal of most, including myself, to give a statement at all, no prosecutions were ever made. Amongst the statements that were made, however, two stand out from the rest. Those of the paramedics who, in the back of the ambulance, attempted to perform an emergency C-section to save her unborn twins, and watched in horror as she gave birth to pups. Scary Movies If you ask most people to visualise their happy place, they instantly conjure up images of yellow sands and palm-fringed beaches, sounds of the surf, blue sky, and sunshine. Or perhaps they see themselves sitting by a log fire, watching the snow falling and layering gently outside the window from the cosy insulation of their warm log cabin. Not Charlie. Asked to name his happy place, Charlie would disregard these cliched retreats in favour of somewhere altogether more unusual. Charlie's happy place was extremely specific, quite different, and considering his age at the time, somewhat inappropriate. His favourite location, the place where he felt the purest tingle of excitement and joy, was in the narrow stack rows of Wenzel's VHS rental store, in the horror section. Charlie had been my best friend since nursery school. We had laughed, cried, and fought together over the years, sharing each other's secrets and laughing at each other's jokes, all whilst teasing each other mercilessly, as adolescent boys always do. The thing I liked most about Charlie, though, the thing that really drew me to him and made me want to spend time with him, was when he became excited. Because Charlie's excitement was contagious. It didn't matter if it was an idea, a TV show, or a movie. When Charlie became excited by something, it was as if his whole being lit up like a beacon, his words becoming quick and rapid-fire whilst his face became red and flushed. It was as if that particular thing, whatever it happened to be, possessed him, and from the moment he encountered it, he could think of or focus upon nothing else. Not that this was a solitary or selfish pursuit that excluded others. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Part of the thrill for Charlie in these moments of excitement was the prospect of sharing whatever had got him going with other people, inviting them to join in the thrill, drawing them in with the gravity of his enthusiasm like a planet pulling asteroids into its orbit. Until, eventually, even if you had previously had not one iota of interest in the topic, you found that whatever had excited Charlie pretty soon started exciting you. In the early days of our friendship, it had been He-Man, and we had spent many hours watching the cartoons, playing with his Castle Grayskull action set, or running furiously around each other's houses and gardens with toy swords stuffed down our jumpers, shouting, I have the power, at every opportunity. A few years later, it was pro-wrestling, a craze which at first I tried my best to resist, Initially, I found the whole thing corny, but after a few months of Charlie introducing me to the larger-than-life characters, the superhero headliners, and the dastardly villains, all played out like a live-action comic book, I was hooked. By the time WrestleMania rolled around that year, we were obsessed, sitting side by side, cross-legged on the floor, and clutching our Hulk Hogan Bendham figures as we screamed at the screen, enraptured. By the age of twelve, however... Charlie had found his real obsession, his happy place, in horror. When I asked him, he said that he couldn't remember specifically the first time he had slipped his mother's grip on his hand and wandered unattended into the horror section of the video store, but he did remember the feeling he got the first time he was in there. He described it as a mix of terror, anticipation, and a familiar, prickling, electric excitement. He recalled standing wide-eyed and staring up at the rows of beautifully grotesque covers, featuring nightmarish images painted in stark slashes of red and black. In some ways, 
It was less the films themselves than the actual cassette tapes, and in particular their boxes and the artwork on the covers, that enthralled him. Surrounded by these fascinating artefacts, the lurid colours and shocking visuals, Charlie had his kid in a candy shop moment, for a kid who never really liked candy. To him, these covers, which in the pre-Photoshop dark ages of the 1980s were hand-painted rather than manipulated from photographs on computers, seemed like darker and more dangerous comic books. He raved often about individual titles, describing in loving detail the fabulous beasts and monsters that peered out from the covers. Werewolves with sprouting muzzles, the skin of their snouts crinkling as the lips drew back over fangs that jutted ever forwards. Beast men covered in shaggy hair, with hands the size of shovels, tipped with razor-like claws, reaching out toward the viewer, whilst bald-headed goblins, slick with slime and ooze, grinned through rows of piranha-like teeth at once threatening and inviting, all of it horribly thrilling. Above, stylized lettering dripped down like blood from the frame. It took him only moments to realize he was in love. The week after this epiphany, he had begged his father to let him rent one of the movies, though the certificate said that he was at least six years too young. On that occasion, he had been denied and had been forced to content himself with the admittedly dark-tinged action of David Bowie prancing around in Labyrinth, Years later, I would look back with great affection on Jim Henson's creature effects for that film, but whilst they were creepy for most youngsters, Charlie still longed for another glimpse of the horror aisle, and more than that, to finally be allowed to take one of its manifold treasures home with him. It was six weeks later that Charlie finally made the breakthrough he needed. From age 12 upward, he had always rushed toward that section of the video store and had continued to beg his parents to no avail, but as weeks went by with no joy, he began to venture into the store either by himself or with me tagging along, always keen to show me new additions or hold lovingly in his hands one of his favourites, trying to memorise every detail. When alone, he had once secretly taken along his sketchbook and slinked into the aisle whilst the clerk was busy with a customer, had plonked himself down on the floor, and proceeded to try to copy some of the images he saw with his pencil. The result wasn't great, but it did allow the clerk to notice his fascination with the genre, something that would come in handy the following week. On that night, Charlie and I, supposedly picking up the pizza we had ordered, spent fifteen minutes longer than we should in the video shop next door. Strolling briskly past the new releases and cardboard cutouts of Stallone and Schwarzenegger, we headed straight for the main event and found the clerk, whom we knew only as Mikey, standing at the end of the aisle with a knowing look on his face. In his hand, he held one of the many lurid VHS boxes, though one that I had never seen before. He smiled a strange, sardonic grin before raising his eyebrows and saying, you guys are a little young for this section, don't you think? Scared that he was going to be told that he couldn't even look at the horror movies, Charlie started to panic. We weren't doing anything, we're just looking. I mean, we're not going to rent one, we're not allowed, but... Mikey interrupted. You're not allowed? By who? Your parents? Still, he smirked, showing his teeth now, adorned with two tracks of coloured braces. I mean, they say you're not allowed, and the policy here says you're not allowed. Mikey mused. I saw Charlie's head begin to dip as he prepared to be banished from his happy place for good. Mikey went on as if mulling over his own words, tasting and assessing them as they left his mouth. But your parents aren't here, and the policy is decided by the desk clerk, and of course that would be me. He added the last few words with a triumphant flick of his bottom lip that was at once confident and also somehow dangerous, using the same sort of vocal inflections you might expect from the snake in the Garden of Eden, only instead of the forbidden fruit, Mikey had tapes to offer. You guys come here every Friday and you always have a pizza. We looked at each other and nodded, slightly perturbed that Mikey had been monitoring our movements quite so closely. Um, yeah, I began. I usually stay over at Charlie's on a Friday, and his parents always let us get one from Piccolo's Pizza next door. 
I gestured toward the wall as if Mikey wouldn't know which direction the next door was. He nodded and again threw a knowing glance. He then looked away and, in a gesture which I suppose was meant to indicate nonchalance, examined his fingernails, an action that would have been more convincing had he not already chewed them off earlier that day, so that he was now just staring at whittled, raw-looking remnants. You think your folks would notice if you only went home with half a pizza? Again, we looked at each other puzzled, before suddenly beginning to see where the conversation was headed. We could tell them we ate most on the way home. They would never know, Charlie fired out, eager to strike a deal with this vendor of visual delights. Well then, maybe next week you hand over half of your pizza and the price of the rental and, you know, the desk clerk might turn a blind eye to your age when you take a tape. I was gobsmacked. Charlie was ecstatic. Wait, so if we bring the money and give you half, we can take what we want? Like... Anything? Mikey nodded slowly. You can take a few as long as you pay for them. I won't say anything if you won't. Just make sure the tape comes back by the following day. Charlie was glowing. For the next week, he wrote lists of titles, weighing up possible orders in which to watch the films and working out how to spend the combined total of our pocket money savings most wisely, hurriedly emptied from piggy banks. He also worked out by way of scribbled calculations that if we changed the variety of pizza we ordered from a 16-inch deep pan meat deluxe to a thin crust 14-inch plain margarita, then we could also use the money we saved to go towards another movie. Mikey had been watching our movements, but Charlie doubted that he knew the specific size or toppings we ordered, so the deception would work perfectly on him. It would mean less pizza for us, but that was no real issue as there was always way more than enough available. We enthusiastically agreed to share a far smaller portion and decided that the deal was more than worth it. The following Friday we made our usual trip to Piccolo Pizza, but stopped Tony, the owner, from making our usual and instead gave him our amended and far less costly alternative. You guys going vegetarian or something? He asked as he sprinkled the mozzarella onto the decidedly diminutive looking pizza. Something like that, Charlie confirmed. Once the pizza was ready, we asked Tony to cut it in half, but not slice it the way he usually would. That way, we could easily transfer the half owed to Mikey and still keep the other half untouched. Then, it was time for the main event. Charlie positively bounced as we made our way to the video store. He had already decided to tell his parents that the pizza took longer to prepare in order to allow himself time to peruse the options, but in truth he had already made his selections. Handing over the prized possessions to Mikey, along with half of the pizza, Charlie was surprised when he took the box and returned with two blank cassette boxes. What's this? he asked, holding the two white cassette boxes emblazoned in one corner with the red Wenzel's VHS Library logo. Mikey sighed heavily. It's a helicopter. The other one's an 18-wheeler articulated lorry. What do you mean, what's this? He responded sarcastically, unable to bring himself to speak to us on equal terms despite our deal and the fact that he was only a few years older. Charlie looked again in dismay at the blank covers. Where's the box? The sleeve with the artwork? I mean, that's part of it. Mikey sucked on an enormous plastic cup full of coke and shrugged. They stay here. You only get the films themselves, doofus. Charlie looked back at me in desperation, as if he had paid for a rifle and been given a slingshot. No, no way, he said finally. I want the actual box, the sleeves with the artwork, the lot. Otherwise the deal ends now. Mikey raised an eyebrow, clearly surprised by Charlie's forthright stance and determination to press the issue. He considered for a moment and, looking down at his portion of our pizza, sighed heavily, took the cassette tapes back from Charlie and placed them into the original boxes. Just don't damage the boxes. It's against policy to give out the proper sleeves. Charlie heeded the warning, though realising that this entire transaction was against company policy, he let the warning glide over him. He was far too interested in his newly acquired prizes to listen to anything Mikey had to say. To some extent, I could understand Charlie's insistence on taking the original sleeves home. For him, the whole thing was a complete package. It wasn't just about the movie itself, 
it was about the actual artifact. He wanted to take it home and savour the imagery that had drawn him to the films in the first place. That first night, we sat in the relative privacy of Charlie's basement room, knees pulled up to our chests, the pizza laid between us, and the remote control handy in case we had to quickly switch off the movie if interrupted. And we watched our first real horror movies together. That first night it was Creepshow and An American Werewolf in London, both of which became firm favourites of ours. For weeks after, Charlie would try to reproduce the artwork on the Creepshow cover, filling his sketchbook with juvenile but technically accomplished imitations of Bernie Wrightson's drawings. In some ways, it seemed that the artwork on the box held more fascination for him than the movie itself, and in fact, on a number of occasions over the coming weeks, we would agree that the film itself did not live up to the promise made by the cover art. Not that we were complaining. Our new, shared, and secretive ritual became the highlight of our week. At school, during the week, we would discuss our favourite parts, critiquing the effects, the makeup, and the acting with surprising maturity. We were never actually frightened by the films at the time, beyond the few well-placed jump scares, or the thrilling tension experienced when watching. We knew that the monsters we saw on screen were just guys in prosthetics. We had both seen the making of Michael Jackson's thriller, and reasoned that if makeup could turn Jacko into some kind of weir cat, then Hollywood could turn anyone into virtually anything. That wasn't to say that the films didn't leave an impression, though. For it was afterwards, when we were apart and alone in the quiet of rooms or walking home in the dark, that the images and ideas on screen, now detached from their storylines and actors, came back to haunt us. In those moments, the rationalising idea that they were simply actors in masks didn't help because it didn't explain what those images were based on. Yes, they were men in masks, but what if the thing beneath my bed wasn't? The guy who stood outside the supermarket dressed as a bear to advertise rice puffs isn't really a bear, but that doesn't mean real bears don't exist, or that if given the chance, a real bear might not actually maul and eat you. The same could be true of monsters. Of course, our fledgling male egos would never have allowed us to admit this to one another. Most times we would never admit that a particular monster or idea came back to prowl slowly behind us on the landings of our homes, that the beast with yellowed fangs seemed to peep out from that space behind the bathroom door that the light never reached. In front of anyone else, for example, I would never have admitted that at times the greatest terror in my daily existence was the stretch between the bottom of the stairs and the living room. That many times when my parents called me from upstairs, I would descend and shrink in fear when I saw that the hall light, the switch for which was on the other side of the hall, was off. Though the distance between the bottom step and the safety of the light and the living room door was only around twelve paces, that expanse, that walk taken through the pitch black, where untold terrors formed from an amalgam of monsters I should never have seen, monsters that could lurk and potentially jump out, snatch me up, dragging me away to be devoured and never seen again, filled me with horror. I would stand, perched on the bottom step, one hand on the light for the stairs, knowing that if I didn't flip it off as I stepped down I would be told off by my father, but wishing I could leave it on. I would wait there and would hold my breath, knowing that as soon as I pushed it, the space both behind me and before me would be black, that I would invite every creeping, snarling thing to take its chance, to leap out and grip me in its curved talons. The only light like a beacon bathing the shore, would be the light coming from around the edges of the living room door, towards which I would bound. Most times I ran, clearing that small hallway in just a few lightning-fast steps, and tumbling into the living room with unwarranted haste, always sure that some terror was snapping at my heels as I did. Once in the safety of the living room, I would be fine, and would walk to the sofa or dining table with exaggerated nonchalance, concealing from my oblivious family the terror I had experienced only moments earlier. A terror which, of course, I would never have admitted to having experienced at all. If accused of harbouring such childish and stupid imaginings and fears, I'd have laughed and balked at the idea. 
most of the time. But then, of course, amongst friends, real friends, even adolescent male ones, there are those moments of crystalline honesty when even the deepest fears can be shared. Once I told Charlie that I still got scared, and he revealed that the same happened to him. Though for Charlie, it was once again the boxes rather than the films themselves that had the greater impact. He admitted one night, after we had finished watching Critters, that sometimes when he was alone in his windowless room, separated from the safety of the rest of the house by a flight of stairs that lay unreachable and impossibly remote on the other side of the room from his bed, he did, sometimes, feel nervous and even scared in the dark. He told me how once he had pulled the covers over his head and endured ridiculous amounts of heat, soaking his bedclothes in sweat, rather than lowering them even a fraction of an inch and making himself vulnerable to whatever was standing over him or lurking in the corner. He described the specific film titles and the individual creatures conjured from images on their covers that came to him in his room at night and threatened to grab his ankles or chew upon him whilst he screamed, unheard. I had thought that by sharing my fears with Charlie, admitting to sometimes being afraid of the dark, I would feel better. I didn't. Whoever said a problem shared is a problem halved was a very selfish person, never taking into account the fact that the listener might have problems of their own to share, and that if both parties exchange and reveal, their problems become the listener's problems too. A problem shared is sometimes a problem doubled. For the first time, I began to look around at the darker corners of Charlie's basement and imagine, as he had when alone, towering beasts watching with bulging eyes, dripping teeth, hanging just out of view. I could tell, as I did this, that talking about it and hearing my own stories of being scared had unnerved Charlie, and so, unbelievably, we calmed ourselves by watching another horror movie, the sanitized and approved realm of fantasy being an escape from the possibility of any real dangers. Not that these creeping fears put us off. Whereas some might have decided not to watch any more scary movies, we instead became hooked. Over the next six to eight months, we devoured every horror title we could from that VHS store. Sometimes, when birthdays, Christmases, or generous relatives came around, we had a little more money and would stretch to three titles in one night. Waking inexplicably shattered on a Saturday morning, with Charlie's parents assuming that we had just stayed up all night, nattering as teenage boys are known to do. It wasn't until the ninth month of our arrangement that the real fear came. Fear that was not like those childhood fancies, but a cold, razor-sharp fear that cut through any surrounding reality or distraction, and demanded attention in the present. We had decided to rent a movie called Cellar Dweller, that Charlie had been eyeing for some time, and which seemed appropriate considering that with his basement room he was essentially a cellar dweller himself. For our second selection, however, we were torn, until Mikey, with a strange little whistle, called us over to the counter. For a horrible moment, we feared that he might be demanding more for his part in the deal, or, worse still, calling the whole bargain to an end. Instead, from under the desk, he produced a VHS tape that we had not only never noticed on the shelves before, but which we had never heard of at all. The cover, which curiously did not feature any text and therefore did not reveal the name of the film, was a beautifully painted and colourful scene worthy of any great horror comic artist. In some ways, it reminded me of the cover art for kids' movies like The Goonies or The Monster Squad, the protagonist being a boy in a red baseball cap, not much older than us, who was leaping out at the viewer from the centre of the composition. Behind him was an open closet door. We had got used to referring to these places as closets, despite the fact that to us they were always the less sinister-sounding cupboards. This closet was overflowing with creatures, each one more hideous than the next, that seemed to be clawing out like things clamouring to escape the jaws of hell. Every one of them had their eyes fixed on the boy, and reached with jagged claws and jutting fangs towards him, to grab, rend, and tear. 
The boy, whose mouth was fixed in a scream of abject horror, glared out pleadingly at the viewer, his arms raised in a desperate cry for help. We looked from the artwork to each other, and with a smiling nod, agreed that this was the one. What's this one called? Charlie asked as we handed over the pizza and payment. Mikey shrugged. Beats me. I found it here on the countertop when I came into work today. No idea what's on it or even what it's called. The dumbasses at the film company have left the title off it, and there's no label on the tape itself. If you figure out what it's called when you watch it, then let me know and I'll write it up. I just thought it was the kind of thing you guys were into. It definitely was. Rushing home, we put aside Cellar Dweller, keen to find out what was on the mystery tape. After inserting the tape, however, Charlie did not press play. Instead, for several minutes he simply sat, cross-legged and staring at the image on the front of the tape. I was about to tease him for this, but glancing over, was myself drawn into considering the image again. It really was an amazing piece of work. My view of the piece began to be obscured, however, as the box began to shake in Charlie's trembling hands. I looked up from the cover and saw that Charlie had turned white. It's... It's the same boy, he muttered, his lips hardly seeming to form the words as his mouth seemed determined to hang slackly open as his eyes stared wildly forwards, fixed on the cover. I looked again at the cover, thinking that perhaps he meant that the actor was someone we had seen in another movie. What I saw made me shrink back and recoil. I looked at it again, at the cover, at Charlie, and at the cover again. It didn't make sense. It was impossible. Contrary to what Charlie had muttered, it was not the same boy. In fact, the boy had changed completely. Whereas in the store, the figure in the center of the composition had been a boy wearing a red baseball cap with dark hair and glasses, screaming wildly, the image now showed a blonde little boy, with no hat, his hair half hidden by the massive clawed hand that was clamped around the cranium as if it were a basketball. I didn't know what to say. Just as I was trying to form words to string together my confusion into a cogent sentence, Charlie leaped to his feet and sprinted up the stairs into his house. I dutifully followed, still stunned by what I had seen. It, it isn't the same boy, Charlie, it's changed, I shouted after him, but he wasn't listening. He ran to the kitchen table and, after some rummaging, came back with that week's local newspaper. The cover showed a photograph of a missing boy. The same missing boy. The same boy as was clearly depicted on the cover. There was no getting around it, it was like a photograph. Without speaking to me or his parents, without asking permission to go anywhere, Charlie grabbed his coat and ran out of the front door into the night, leaving it wide open for me to close behind him as I struggled to keep up. Where are you going? I screamed after him. Wenzel's, was his breathless reply. Within ten minutes we were rushing through the doors of Wenzel's VHS rental store. A clearly surprised-looking Mikey came out from behind the counter to meet us, but other than that, the store was empty, most viewers having selected their entertainment of choice far earlier in the evening. What the hell are you clowns doing here? Mikey spat, looking around nervously as if he were about to accuse him of something sinister. Listen, it ain't my problem if the films gave you nightmares. You pay your money, you take your choice, no refunds. Without saying a word, Charlie held up the cover and the newspaper. Mikey initially looked confused and seemed about to make another dismissive comment, but then, as he squinted at the image, his face changed from one of cocky overconfidence to one of stunned confusion. It's different. The picture, I, I mean the picture, that that's not what it looked like before. As he shook his head, we nodded ours. Eventually, we decided as a three that we needed to see what was on the tape. Mikey popped it into the VHS he kept by the counter. At first, it was just static. It seemed that the tape was blank. But then, an image danced onto the screen. Initially, it was just black. From somewhere off-screen, there was a low, jittering laugh, something like a hyena. Then, in the top portion of the screen, a light appeared. 
The image was a silhouette of someone sleeping. The only pale light source was square of the window in the top third of the screen. There were low titters, then a voice, a child's voice, as the silhouette in the bed stirred, and the voice, clearly coming from that shifting shape in the bed, cried out, Who, Who's there? And after a moment, Mummy? Is that you? Mummy? Mummy, I'm scared. Then came the horror. An explosion of sound, screams of terror and pain, drowned out by furious thrashing and growling like a pack of wild dogs fighting over a hunk of meat. Then silence, and the image cut to static. We stood, silently watching the screen, none of us daring to vocalise what we thought we might have just seen. None of us daring to look back at the newspaper and the photograph. We left the tape there. We didn't go back to Wenzel's until two months later, and even then, it was only me. I had received a call at home, to the landline at my house. Expecting it to be Charlie on the other end, I rushed to the phone table in the hall by the door and picked up the receiver. The voice on the other end was Mikey. You need to come here. You need to come now. I tried to ask him what he was talking about, but got no response. So, unable to reach Charlie, though I called his house three times, I made my way to Wenzel's VHS. When I got there, I was surprised to find the store closed, but Mikey standing expectantly behind the glass door, peering out and clearly waiting for me. When he caught sight of me, he unlocked the door and ushered me hurriedly inside. Without saying a word, he reached under the counter and presented me with that same dreaded VHS tape. Reluctantly, I took it from him and stared at the cover, expecting, hoping, to see that same blonde boy that I had seen on there. Instead, I saw Charlie. There was no mistaking it. Every detail of his face was perfectly captured. It was Charlie. Not only that, but the background image had changed. Now, instead of a closet, the monsters were flooding from shadows around a set of stairs that led down into a basement room. I snatched the video from Mikey and, without paying or saying a word, ran as fast as I could down the main street, across a blur of lawns and fences, past a seemingly never-ending stream of streetlights until finally I came to Charlie's door. I hammered on the front door like I was possessed. No one answered although eventually a neighbour emerged and informed me that Charlie's parents had gone to the police station. Charlie was missing. I never saw Charlie again, and I never told anyone about the tape, especially Charlie's parents. Firstly, because I didn't think they'd believe me. Secondly, because if they did, and Charlie was already dead, they would watch the tape. Hear, or even perhaps see, their child torn to pieces by the things that emerge from the shadows. I didn't want that for them. Plus, there was no point. I could not have shown them the tape to verify my story. The same day I took it home, I built a small fire in the back garden and burnt the thing to ashes. I watched in tears as the paper burned and the curling plastic melted. I remember watching it shrivel and hoping beyond hope that this copy was the only one. This is only the second time I have told this story. The first time, the only other time, was to my wife around ten years ago. I am telling it now because last week she found an article online that she thought might be relevant to my story. It was just your average, poorly researched, clickbait article thrown together by some hack looking to make a few dollars, but the story itself chilled me. It concerned a man named Bernard Lawton. A comic book artist, he had worked primarily in horror comics, having produced some particularly detailed and lurid artwork for EC Comics and later for Creepy and Eerie. He also produced cover art for VHS releases of horror movies. In the early 1970s, he was committed to a psychiatric ward after having become convinced that the things he was painting in his work were real. He remained in the hospital for 17 years, during which time he continued to paint the same image over and over 
covering his walls with splendidly detailed images all the same, except for the main character, who, though always a child pursued by monsters, would change in appearance with every version. Lawton died in 1986, the same year that Charlie disappeared. It seems he was somehow able to get hold of some matches and, using correction fluid and turpentine, to set himself alight. He burned to death in his cell before anyone could get in to rescue him. The article did not provide an exact date, but I have a feeling that in a back garden somewhere in England there was a videotape burning at the exact same time. Whilst on the ward, Lawton is said to have completed over fifty of these strange paintings, of which thirteen were alleged to have been rescued from the fire. Having reached an almost mythical status, these thirteen lost horrors are now considered to be a highly valuable holy grail by collectors of horror comic art and fans of the strange and macabre. Having read the article and heard about the search for these missing pieces, I can only say this. Stop looking. Bernard Lawton's art, all of it, was sold to a single anonymous buyer years ago. That buyer spent his entire lump sum redundancy pay tracking down every last scribble from that man's wicked pen. The collection will never be displayed and will never go on sale. Period. The buyer, to this day, has always chosen to remain anonymous, though, cryptically, he has been quoted as saying that standing beside a roaring fire and watching evil burn is where he finds his happy place. Flames Sometimes, when people ask my name, I find it a little hard to know which one to give. My real name, the one that was on my birth certificate, was Leonard Merlode, though that's probably the one I use least, if I'm honest. Online, I mostly go by Magic Merlin, and in some groups, just Mage171. At work, they just used to call me Merle. When I had, you know, proper work. For a long time, I was a research scientist working in technology development for a major games company. I was good, too, even if I do say so myself. I could probably sit beside 90% of gamers sitting down at a console tonight, and unless they're properly retro and playing something like World Cup Italia 90 on a beat-up Sega Mega Drive, I could tell them at least five things, from their gameplay experience to the graphics to the actual processing responsible for their games, that I, personally, worked on or developed myself. For a brief moment there, I was a bit of a legend. In the last years at my job, I sort of worked for myself. I'd outgrown the whole having a boss who gives you assignments kind of thing. It was getting kind of boring. I could never make that model stick. By the time the people upstairs had decided what they wanted me working on next, I was already five steps ahead working on something entirely different, which was never good. I work quickly, and I lose interest quickly. Unless the project excites me, the results aren't going to be good, and in those kind of jobs I felt like I was getting stuck on stuff, or buried under projects that should have died a death years earlier. For the work to be good, I have to feel it. When I'm interested, when I have a reason or an inspiration, that's when I work best. So, instead of a boss, I had my own workshops. In my workshops, I could work on my own stuff, develop whatever technology or idea took my interest, and then, when it was ready to be shown to the world, I could approach all the major companies, show them what I had, and let them fight over the end product. Eventually, I'd sell it to the highest bidder, by which time it would be in the hands of my lawyers, and I'd have moved on to some entirely different project. Working like that was perfect for me, until I said no to the wrong people. That was when they sent Dex. After that, after seeing one of my workshops and half my life's work go up in smoke, not to mention what came after, well, I kind of lost the drive for it. Plus, of course, there were other projects occupying my time. To start, though, 
I should probably explain a few things. For example, it would probably be good for you to know who Dex is and what he did for a living. It would probably also be good for you to know exactly who I said no to and why. Context, I feel, is always important, particularly in a confession, which I suppose in some ways this is. Part confession, part status report, but definitely more confession. Dexter Lorraine is the man that those who know enough to know why call Flames. For most people he is known simply as Dex. For much of his early life, Dexter was in the military and indeed was well respected for his abilities. After leaving the military he got a job working for a chemical company. Observed from the outside, by anyone who had the care to pay enough attention, this would have looked suspicious. My grandfather used to say that jobs could be divided into two categories, those that pay you from the neck up and those that pay you from the neck down. Considering his background and abilities, Dex's choice of category seemed a little odd. During his service, Dex had been a munitions expert, a job that required detailed information, accurate processing, and a whole heap of critical thinking under pressure. He had a background in chemical engineering and a degree from a prestigious university. Whilst the company he eventually worked for after leaving the service was a well-known and widely respected one, Dex's position within the company wasn't. The job he did day to day was very much a fetch-me-carry-me labour-based job, a job that required him to deliver orders and move barrels, basically humping stuff from one location and then humping them onto a van in another. Whilst I have never been one to condescend to any job or to judge people by what they choose to do, I am a coder at heart. For me, a chain is only a chain if everything is equally as important, it would be fair to say that it was a job for which Dex seemed massively overqualified and perhaps not entirely suited. Again, it was a choice that may have raised eyebrows, had anyone's eyebrows actually been focused on Dex in the first place. But of course, they weren't. You can't connect the dots when you don't know the dots exist. That was the way Dex liked it. In retrospect, with 2020 clarity afforded by hindsight, We would of course look with some suspicion at the fact that mercenary groups in the Congo and terrorist organisations on three different continents had chemicals that could be traced back not only to the company that Dex worked for, but also to the exact plant, and in some cases, the exact depot he was in charge of. Had they been looking at the time, authorities may have been interested in the quantities of chemicals that were reported missing from these plants and depots. They might have been interested in the inconsistencies between the records of quantities going in and those coming out, and how, coincidentally, these happened to be the same sorts of chemicals used to process cocaine and other narcotics, not to mention to make explosives. They might have been interested, but they weren't. Only I was. And only then, in retrospect. Even then, these details don't come close to being the most interesting aspects of Dex's work. That title is reserved for the fires. They didn't call him Flames for nothing. I am not very often what one would consider a hacker. I know how to do it, and in fact do it very well, but it's just not my thing. It's a useful tool to have if ever you want to find things out that someone else doesn't want you to know, but it isn't something I like doing, and I'm certainly not in league with any of those political hacking groups. To me, those guys always seem to be driven more by ego or some misguided sense of anarchy than anything else. Sabotage, industrial espionage, and vandalism are all things I abhor, and coincidentally things that most hackers enjoy, so I try to stay out of it. I did, however, hack the mainframe servers of the central police network a few years ago. Not because I wanted to disrupt anything, but because I wanted some information. You see... For me, disruption is the exact opposite of what I wanted. To me, a good hack involves being incredibly quiet and imperceptible. You wouldn't break into someone's home whilst beating a bass drum or leaving massive footprints everywhere, would you? So why would you do that when you break into someone's computer? My preference is to get in as quietly as possible, get what I need, and get out before anyone notices usually leaving a small hidden entrance for myself in case I ever want to go back. In the case of my research on decks, 
nobody noticed. Most likely because the type of things I was looking for were in entirely separate and unrelated files, in different departments, and spread over years. As I said earlier, you don't connect the dots if you don't know they're there. I had begun to connect them. First, though, we should take a trip back in time. In 2015, I was working on revolutionary technology. The idea had come to me a few years earlier whilst talking to my girlfriend over a Skype chat. Things had started to get a little bit raunchy, and she had happened to say, I wish I could feel you. That was all it took. In a flash of an instant, I saw the whole thing. The blueprint, the application, the mechanics necessary, the coding it would take to produce it. The conversation itself took place in 2012. It took me three years to make what I saw in my mind's eye come to life in the real world. But, in essence, the entire thing was born, constructed, and completed in a few seconds, right there in my bedroom. It was already real to me. It already existed in this world because it existed in my mind. It was just set to private for a while whilst it was still in my head. All I had to do was get it out of my head and into the physical world so other people could see it and use it. My ideas are always like that. I called it Vlesh. Virtual Flesh. That first night when I saw it in my head, I even saw the box it would come in, the logo with a huge neon V and the rest of the word in jagged angular print. To explain, Vlesh was to be a suit of sorts. Basically, it would be worn a little like armour. Think of it a little like a wetsuit that divers wear, but instead of being constructed from rubber, it would be made up of several hundred small patches of synthetically produced skin, like the ear grown on the back of a mouse in that weird experiment, and something similar to the vegan impossible meats that my girlfriend loves to eat instead of steak. The outside of the flesh suit looked like bleached white skin, whilst the inside was lined with hundreds upon hundreds of microscopic sensors that pressed against the wearer's actual skin. There would then be a gauge for the wearer to decide what level of intensity they required, how much, in essence, they wanted to feel. Because the idea of the flesh suit was to mimic the experience of skin without actually damaging the wearer, the synthetic flesh would be sensitive to pressure, temperature, and a damage encoded by the game or the virtual environment. By being linked to the wearer's own skin, it would send messages to the brain and make the wearer feel as if whatever were happening to the flesh was happening to them. If in the game I sent the person to the Arctic naked, they would feel the cold, experience the sensations of getting frostbite, whilst their own skin and body remained entirely intact and unaffected. Vlesh allowed them to feel the game. It was going to be so cool. For example, if you were playing a beat-em-up or boxing game against a friend who was in another state, or even another country, you could both wear your flesh suits, agree on the level of sensitivity, and when you fought, throwing virtual punches or kicks in the simulated environment, you would feel the blows as if they were actually landing. Combined with virtual reality, the experience would be like having a second body. As for lovers, well, even if separated, the experience of touch between two people could be simulated. If you did it in there, you'd feel it out here. It took me three years, but my girlfriend would get her wish in the end. Obviously, each game or virtual environment would need to have its own built-in levels and limiters, so that, for example, if you were playing some kind of war game and you were shot, the pain would not be even close to the actual experience of being shot, but would make the wearer more than aware that they had been tagged. The problem with the technology was, it was too good. Without limiters, the experience would be exactly like being shot. Sometimes, the brain, unable to distinguish between what was real and what was fabricated, would make the body react. Yes, the suit could be removed, the simulation stopped, and the instant the virtual experience ended, the physical experiences would end too, but in the meantime, well, the wearer could go into shock or be psychologically damaged. Whilst I could see that there might be some benefit in a system that could simulate physical touch and get kids playing war games out of the mindset that shooting people is an inconsequential act, by letting them feel at least a fraction of what it might be like, I didn't like the idea of people having their own control over that technology. There had to be a way to install limits that were less than what would be experienced in reality, just to protect people. Of course, 
Installing limiters from the start might make it less marketable. I could see how professional athletes might want to turn the physical experiences right up to mimic the feeling of actual competition on a skin they could then take off at the end of the session, allowing them far quicker recovery time. But I never imagined there would be a market or application for a system that could accurately mimic the experience of being shot without actually damaging the skin. Until I got the call. The man said he was a general, and pronounced his name as if I should have heard of him. Of course I hadn't. He explained that they had gotten wind of my little experiments and wanted to offer me an astronomical sum to share the technology. To his credit, when I asked what they wanted to use the technology for, he didn't sugarcoat it. He explained that they intended to use the technology for training purposes. If you could send someone into combat and have them experience all the environmental circumstances without actually being there, that is brilliant training. If soldiers could be shot on screen and feel what it's like to be shot for real with no lasting consequences, that would provide excellent training. Not only by giving them an idea of what to expect, but by making them even less keen to take the hit in practice. The threat of actually feeling the bullet would drive them to be better, move faster, and react quicker, thereby making better soldiers. It would also allow the military to subject trainees to simulated environments with intense and even dangerous conditions or extremes without actually endangering them. They would actually feel the pain as if they were there, but as soon as someone hit the off switch, the pain would stop. The session would be over, and they could come back to repeat the session and correct their mistakes the following day. It sounded extreme, even outrageous, but I could understand the logic. In principle, although the ethics were highly questionable, it wasn't completely abhorrent. What was abhorrent was the potential. The fact that if I signed over the technology for military use, they could adapt it, reverse engineer it, and extend its capabilities without the need for my approval or moral guidance. If, for example, they wanted to place a captive or opposition fighter in the Vlesh suit, They could crank the dial up as far as they wanted, even exceeding the sensitivity that the skin actually has, so that even the lightest touch in the virtual world would become painful. They could develop programs and simulations that had nothing to do with training, but instead became virtual torture chambers, where they could subject their victims to untold levels of pain and agony for as long as they wished, either to extract confessions or information, or simply to punish or harm them. I worried that being able to release the victim, who would have experienced being shot 50 times, stabbed or electrocuted over and over, and show them entirely unscathed afterwards, would erase all evidence of war crimes. The ability to show the victim without a cut or bruise on their body would lead to too much temptation. I also wondered whether the definitions of torture in things like the Geneva Convention and bills of human rights would legislate for this technology. Would simulated torture count, or would that be a loophole? I was sure that if this did happen, the legal definition would be changed to accommodate treatment in a flesh suit in time. But until then? It should be clear that there was no suggestion during our meeting that this avenue would be explored, but still, the idea had taken root. The possibility was real that the technology could be exploited in that way. So, I said no and they sent Dex. For whilst no government official ever stated that they would pursue that possibility, it didn't mean they hadn't thought of it, either for their own use or as a potential threat. When I said that I would not let them use the technology, would not sell it to them at any price, the technology transitioned from the former to the latter. If it was not being used by them, then it was a threat, because it could be potentially used by others. The general explained as much to me and highlighted with special emphasis how the government would find that prospect very concerning. I tried to explain that I could build limiters into the technology, but he seemed unconvinced. In his mind, if I could figure out how to limit the technology, someone else could figure out how to unpick my work and unlimit it. He asked again, giving me, he said, a final chance to reconsider. When I said no yet again, he elevated the government's stance to gravely concerned. It was at this point that another man, 
who had somehow managed to let himself in, entirely uninvited, strolled casually over and joined the general in our meeting. At first, I assumed him to be a driver or some lackey for the general's day-to-day operations, but after whispering something in the general's ear, he turned to face me directly and spoke. I think you really need to reconsider your decision. The thing about organizations like the military is that they don't like to be told no. I am going to give you one last chance, or you are going to seriously regret it. Later I would hear the general refer to him as Dex, but at the time I had no idea who this man was. In contrast to the general, he was wearing civilian clothes and looked, if I'm honest, a little shabby by comparison. Is that a threat? I asked bluntly, somewhat taken aback by the bold ferocity of his words. No, he said quietly, before taking a step closer so that we were almost nose to nose and I could smell the stench of stale cigarettes on his breath. It is a statement of fact, cold, hard fact, that you would do well to take heed of. I smiled, attempting to show that I was not scared, though I could feel myself trembling. The shabby man looked me up and down and smiled, a cold crocodilian smile, before touching the general on the shoulder, nodding and bidding me a good day, knowing full well, I believe, that my day was about to be far from good. The explosion that tore through my workshop was not simulated. It was as real as could be, and threw me to the ground with such force that I broke my collarbone and chipped bones in my shoulder. Struggling to my feet, I saw the entire back wall of the warehouse missing and sprinted for the door, just in time to see a massive fireball consume most of the left side of the workshop. It is unbelievable to me that fire of that size, of such an enormous scale, was not attended by fire services until over an hour later. Apparently there had been roadblocks with concrete barricades set up in the roads surrounding the property, though no agency ever claimed responsibility for putting them up. After calling the fire department, I immediately tried to call my friends and colleagues at the other workshops I had set up around the country. There were seven in total. As it happened, I never got past the call to the first. I tried the registered number of the workshop and received no reply. Fearing the worst, I tried a mobile number, the number of the phone belonging to Padma, my girlfriend, who worked at the second site. Again, there was no answer. I made further phone calls, inquiring with surrounding businesses, with police departments in the area, until finally I received news that the building had gone up in flames. It was four hours later that I received a call to say that six bodies had been recovered at the second site, four from the third, and so on. In total, 18 of my closest friends and colleagues were killed. My entire life's work, not only on this project, but on innumerable others, appeared to have gone up in flames. I did not attend the funerals. For even then, I knew. After making the phone calls that informed me about my friends and workshops, I ran. I dropped the phone, though I knew it was encrypted and untraceable, into the drain and retreated to a nearby car parking lot, where I remained for almost two days, hunched in a corner of the upper floor. I spent the time writhing in pain, starving, and looking out as if from a concrete watchtower as firefighters tried to battle the flames. My shoulder and chest were killing me, but I knew that was a problem that would have to wait, just as I would have to wait also. I did, and eventually, my patience was rewarded. At around 4am on the second day, an expensive-looking black car pulled up beside the still smouldering ashes of my workshop. Two men, whom I recognised as the general and his shabby friend Dex, ducked under the barriers and tape that had been set up around the site and casually strolled onto the blackened landscape. Using metal rods, they picked and sifted through the remnants. I knew what they were looking for. They had intentionally destroyed the technology, so they were not searching for that. Rather, they were looking for evidence of the other things they had destroyed. Namely, me. Though I was starving and thirsty, I waited another four hours after the pair left to sneak out from the car park. I am not proud to say that I stole a car, drove to some nearby woods, set the car alight, and then made my way on foot to the bunker where I knew I would be safe. I had set the bunker up years earlier. It was within a mile of the main workshop, 
It was located in a patch of woodland, on land that had been purchased in Padma's mother's name, a precaution I had taken to stop people linking the place directly to me. From the outside, it looked just like a piece of wasteland, scattered with trees. Below the surface, however, accessed via a well-concealed trapdoor, there was a veritable nerve centre. I have been living in the bunker ever since. I have a water supply and food is delivered to nearby locations via a network of friends and colleagues I correspond with securely online. It was from here that I learned that I had been recorded as dead. I had no family other than Padma, but if I had, it would have been told that I died in a tragic fire. No mention was made of the coincidental fact that many of my other workshops burnt down on the same day, or that people close to me, people I loved, perished in those fires. It was also from the bunker that I learned more about Dex. Over the past fifteen years, there have been over one hundred massive fires in this country that firefighters have chalked up as suspected arson, but which they have been unable to prove a cause for. One article that I found on the dark web posited the theory that these fires, all of which somehow financially benefited people already rich enough that they did not need to financially benefit, could have been started by the same solo arsonist, perhaps as paid work. By accessing the police and fire department computers, I was able to access the records and site analysis of all these fires, and to trace the similarities and connections between them, dots that had not been previously connected. In every case, the source of the fire seemed to come from the same pattern of multiple start points. In every case, chemical residue was found in the buildings, chemicals that matched those stores at the chemical works where Dex found employment. By tracing the owners of these buildings and holdings companies, I was able to identify links that had not been previously made between them. For example, how closely four of the men worked with each other, all being members on the boards of each other's companies, or the fact that two of them signed over ownership of their property to the others just weeks before their individual and entirely unrelated fires, meaning that they would never be suspected of having set or ordered the fires at places they owned, that would pay out masses of insurance damages. It was a network and a web, and at the centre of it, the plump spider in the shabby clothes, Dex. It took me a month, scouring through the emails between this clan of crooks, who had clearly orchestrated the burning of their properties for high insurance gains before I finally found references to a man named Dex. As I began to piece together the references, I found his chemical-covered fingerprints on over 90 of the fires. Dex, it appeared, was an arsonist for hire, a man with enough knowledge of combustion and how to go about creating a structured conflagration to avoid any evidence of arson. He would burn down any and every structure you paid him to, whilst also ensuring that the authorities would never be able to prove that you had anything to do with it. In my searches, I found warehouses, office blocks containing sensitive documents, a solicitor's office, and even a police station, where, conveniently, the evidence room storing samples that were to be used in a high-profile case a month later were stored, all raised to the ground. Whilst this might sound bad enough, the picture became even darker when you factored in the fires that cleaned the lives of several well-known gang leaders. All were separate incidents, but the elimination of these rivals all seemed, coincidentally, to benefit one surviving gang leader in particular. Then there were the husbands who claimed massive payouts on the life insurance of wives who had tragically perished in house fires. The husbands, of course, had a concrete alibi and couldn't possibly have been involved, but of course, Dex could. In at least two cases, the fire had not only removed the husband's tiresome wife, but had also left him able to enjoy his newfound wealth without the demands of looking after children. Dex's day job was, quite clearly, a cover that allowed him easy access to the materials he needed for his real trade. How the sinister elements under whose employ he did his real work found him, I still have no clue. With much of his work going on in the days before every action left a digital footprint, his early efforts are hard to trace, but I can say with absolute confidence that Dex is personally responsible for the death of at least 50 individuals, all of whom burned to death, all of whom were innocent, and some of whom 
were my friends. Held against a record like this, my crimes seem wholly insignificant. I haven't killed anyone. But then, that's kind of the point. I found Dex early last year. It took me a while to hack the phones of his contacts and eventually link to his personal phone. After that, using the GPS and his bank records, it was easy to monitor his movements and I bided my time waiting for the right moment. It seemed fitting, considering where I had spent the night after he burnt my dreams to ashes, that our next fateful meeting should be in a car park. The tranquilizer went in without a sound, and other than the wet thud as Dex's head hit the concrete, there was no noise at all. I can say now, with absolute confidence, that Vlesh will never be released to the general market. Not because it was destroyed in the fire, but because in the time since the fire, I have seen exactly what it is capable of. Having repaired and refitted some of the prototypes that I kept in the bunker, I spent many months developing a very special environment for my good friend Dex. You see, not only is the technology capable of simulating agonizing pain, making the wearer feel exactly as if they were being, just for example, roasted alive, but it has the additional property of never actually receiving any damage or deteriorating, meaning that as long as the wearer's actual nerves are given adequate time to recover, they can have the same excruciating experience over and over for as long as the person inflicting the treatment wants it to go on for. Obviously, for that kind of thing to happen in real life, the person inflicting the pain would have to be truly heartless, or at least deeply, deeply vengeful. Dex has been my guest for almost nine months now. He is strung up in my bunker, wearing the flesh suit and fed through a tube. On his head is a VR headset, and in his mouth a ball gag. For every day of these nine months, he has experienced the same scenario over and over again. And so he will, until I get bored. I'm sure it will happen. At some point, torturing him will get old, and I'll lose interest and move on to some new project. But for now, Dex will be kept alive in my bunker, where, to my unceasing delight, he will burn and burn and burn. The Vampire's Price As curator of the Onger Slate Curiosity Museum, I have seen my fair share of strange and often disturbing artefacts. From witch bottles filled with nails and urine, recovered from the walls of medieval buildings, to supposedly haunted dolls, a puppet made from a shrunken scoundrel and the bones of Roman soldiers, this collection has seen it all. A vast cornucopia of ephemera and arcana, all linked by their ability to arouse wonder or catch the interest of those who are particularly drawn to the strange and the macabre, its scope is beyond even what you can imagine. You name it, if it is of a strange, fortean, or mildly grisly nature, then in all likelihood, at one time or another, it will have passed through my hands, or spent time amongst our collection. Of all the strange exhibits housed amongst these shelves, however, there is only one that has ever truly chilled my blood. Only one whose image follows me home, occupying a corner of my mind long after the museum has closed, and I am lying in bed at home, awake and alone in the dark, listening. I must explain that the sense of unease I feel around this artifact is not simply superstition, nor is it due to the thing's appearance. In fact, unlike many of the other more gruesome exhibits we have on display, this item is a somewhat innocuous, if not beautiful, piece. The reason why I avoid touching or even being close to this particular piece is not because of some ephemeral notion or haunting tale, but because I know its story better than anyone else alive, at least in the conventional sense. I know it to be genuine because at one point this item's long and storied history intersected directly with my own, in the most literal sense. I can speak personally to its authenticity and 
terrifyingly to the truth behind its outlandish legend, a legend which, unlike the others, has not faded with time, but has become stronger, and, I fear, is still alive and well, even as I write these words. The item in question is labelled in our collection as The Tooth of Judas, Whilst the name of the item may lead the reader to suppose that this piece would be better housed in some reliquary or in the vault of some religious institution, its moniker is somewhat misleading. The tooth is not, as one might think, an actual molar said to have belonged to Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of Christ, nor is it actually a real tooth of enamel and dentine at all. Rather, it is a hunk of solid silver, fashioned to resemble a canine tooth, which nevertheless can and indeed has been worn in place of a missing tooth. The link to the biblical character, as some readers may have guessed, lies in the fact that the silver used to fashion the tooth is alleged to have been taken from the thirty pieces given to Judas as payment for his betrayal of Jesus. For those not familiar with the story, the Gospel of Matthew states that Judas Iscariot, one of Christ's twelve apostles, and therefore one of his closest friends and confidants, betrayed him by selling him out to the authorities who planned to eliminate him. Placing a kiss upon his cheek, an act which then allowed the authorities to identify, arrest, and eventually execute Jesus, the betrayer became an archetype, shorthand for avarice, duplicity, and wickedness. According to Matthew's account, Judas received thirty pieces of silver as payment for turning in his friend and teacher, coins which, depending on which account you believe, he either gave back in a fit of remorse or used to buy the potter's field, a field in which, in an agony of guilt, he eventually hanged himself, his bowels spilling out as he did so. A suitably gruesome end, for history's most notorious traitor. For many centuries, the authentic silver pieces, or Judas pennies as they are known, were believed to have been held in a vault in the Vatican in Rome, having been brought together into a single collection in the late 13th and early 14th century, the reason for this being that a papal edict written in 1291, a copy of which can be read in the online editions of Vatican Public Records for those interested in such things, tasked the famed Monsignor John Lementor with collecting the pieces. Lementor, who was thirty years old when he received this order, was charged with retrieving any and all extant examples of such relics, no matter where they might be housed. This Herculean task, which required years of research even before he set out to investigate the numerous churches and cathedrals that claimed to have authentic pieces, took Lementor twenty years to complete, and indeed became his life's work. In his search for these disparate fragments, the mentor is said to have visited 170 separate churches in over 27 individual countries throughout Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. A feat which, measured by the standards of the time, would have made him one of the most widely travelled men on earth. Though collecting thirty pieces from one hundred and fifty separate locations might initially seem to make no mathematical sense, it is worth noting that Lementor had no way of knowing which churches housed genuine relics and which, knowingly or not, displayed fakes or imitations. It is also worth considering that Lementor did not return with only thirty or even one hundred and fifty pieces, as of course many of the parishes in question claim to have more than one coin from the supposed thirty involved in the act. As a result, by the time he finally returned to Rome in 1311, Lementor had collected well in excess of six hundred silver coins, all claiming to have been given to Judas, and amongst which it was thought the thirty genuine pieces would be found. Whilst Lementor's journey was in itself a miraculous effort, the job was far from complete. Assessing which of the pieces collected could actually have passed through the hands of the betrayer would be no easy task, and according to the records, deciding which of the pieces were genuine took the better part of a decade and involved over one hundred members of the clergy, 
It is at this point that the history of these artefacts becomes somewhat hazy. Exactly where they were housed after this point remains a mystery that theologians, archaeologists, and historians have argued about ever since. Even now, there are places such as the Hunt Museum in Limerick that claim to have examples of the genuine article. They don't. I say this not to undermine or disparage the efforts made by the experts at the Hunt. I am sure that they and even some of the visitors to that institution believe the coin to be genuine. It is from the correct period and geographical location, and though the too perfect inscription of the price of blood etched onto the reverse makes it a little dubious for my tastes, in the eyes of most it has as good a claim as any. It is only because I have been cursed to know otherwise that I can say, with all certainty, that the coin isn't genuine. How I can be so certain is the subject of this story. For much of my working life I both owned and operated a specialist antiques dealership in London, my specific interest and speciality being the sale and acquisition of rare religious artefacts. Whilst the actual transactions that made me money involved sitting behind a desk or manning the counter at our premises in London, and it was here that clients viewed the pieces and money changed hands, I was, in actual fact, rarely there. So rare and highly prized were my acquisitions that, if I sold four in the space of a year, it was more than enough to afford me a comfortable lifestyle and to finance the travels that I undertook. In reality, rather than manning the counter in some dusty antiques dealership, the actual bread and butter of my profession and the pursuit which took up the majority of my time was the tracking down and acquiring of the items in the first place. This process, which often involved prolonged and sometimes dangerous trips to remote locations, was as exciting as it was morally dubious. It was also tremendous fun. I will admit that even before the day that Mr. Truman Barrymore first darkened my door, I had more than once imagined myself as a modern John Lamentor, scouring forgotten churches and hidden mosques in far-flung corners of the map in search of books, icons, ornaments, and effigies, all of which believers and collectors would pay astronomical prices to possess, either because they were obsessive in their pursuit or because they believed these objects to be endowed with powers and properties far more valuable than money. I am partly proud and partly ashamed to say that I never left a client disappointed, no matter the lengths to which I had to go in order to secure a piece. However, whilst I will admit that my transactions often involved nefarious, underhanded, or indeed outright deceitful measures, I would not describe anything I ever did as truly evil. In fact, Evil was something I considered to be many steps removed from my own humble pursuits, and indeed my life, until the day I met Truman Barrymore. Then, all at once, it seemed that evil had followed me home. Even now, decades later, I am still waiting for it to leave. I first met Truman Barrymore in the summer of 1983. I had been sitting at a table in a small café in Istanbul, sipping periodically from a tulip-shaped glass of Turkish tea, and examining, as I did, a partially fractured statuette of St. Peter, wondering whether I should admit to the breakage which would reduce the thing's value, or pass it on to one of the skilled craftsmen with whom I worked, in the hope that they might be able to repair it in such a way that the damage would not be obvious. I was in the process of weighing up the moral and financial implications of this decision when, all at once, I noticed that the sun on my table had been obscured by some obstacle, and a long shadow had fallen over its surface. Looking up, I saw that the cause of this sudden darkening was a tall man who was standing almost touching the edge of the table and looking down at me. He was dressed from head to toe in black, in a manner that I assumed must have been stiflingly hot in the oppressive heat of the city. Noticing that the man was not, as I first suspected, simply passing by, 
I immediately reached forward protectively and scooped up the statuette, wrapping it hastily in a thick cloth and placing it back into my satchel. Still, the man had neither moved nor spoken. Rather, he simply stood there, looming over the table like some great obelisk or monolith that had been suddenly erected as an ornament. Slightly perturbed and not a little put out by this, I looked directly into the man's face and addressed him sternly. I'm sorry, was there something I could help you with? I said, in that typically English way of using an empty offer of assistance when what one actually wants to communicate is unvarnished dissatisfaction with the person's continued and intrusive presence on the planet. It was a stupid thing to say, because it allowed Barrymore, American and therefore oblivious to the subtleties of polite rudeness, the opportunity to actually take me up on the offer. Putting himself down in a seat at my table, he seemed to assume that the question had been an invitation. There are a number of things you can do for me. That's why I'm here, he hissed with a strangely crooked smile. I sighed, realizing as I did that I was now doomed to at least make polite conversation with this individual who had apparently, deliberately sought me out. Barrymore, meanwhile, as nonchalant and relaxed as if he were seated with an old friend rather than someone upon whom he had just imposed himself without explanation, took out a foul-smelling cigarette and began to smoke it, flicking the ash without a care into the small bowl in which several sugar cubes were still stacked. I think it is safe to say that I disliked Barrymore from the start, though his money and the delicious habit it had of becoming my money increased the threshold of my tolerance a great deal. I must also admit that despite being a repulsive and ill-mannered individual and a nightmare to share any close proximity with, he was nonetheless a committed and gifted scholar and a fiercely intelligent man. Not to mention the fact that most prominent amongst his dirty habits was his continued insistence upon being filthy rich, a quality which I always find enamoring amongst my acquaintances, especially when they are in the habit of sharing. Over the course of several hours on that first day, Barrymore explained that he was not only a biblical scholar and an avid collector of religious artifacts, but also, he insisted, a sorcerer. Despite my best efforts, this last claim still raised an eyebrow, which my new friend clearly translated as being indicative of disbelief. He smiled at this and, clicking his fingers, imploded the glass from which I had been drinking without touching it. Recoiling from the shattered glass and patch of tea that now seeped into the tablecloth, I eyed him cautiously. Now, I am not saying that this small demonstration convinced me of anything. I had seen enough fakirs, close-quarter magicians, and peddlers of cheap parlor tricks not to be intimidated by so vulgar a display— it was, however, unsettling. Unsettling to see how badly Barrymore wanted me to believe that he was proficient in the dark arts, and the lengths to which he would go to convince me. In response to his glass smashing, I simply waited a few seconds before calling a waiter to have the pieces removed and a new tea brought over. Very impressive, I lied. You have my attention, though I don't really see what I can help you with. Over the next two hours, he told me. From a small briefcase that I had somehow not noticed him either holding or placing beneath the table, Barrymore produced a series of documents and placed them on the newly dried table for me to examine. It took me less than a second to recognize the Vatican seal, registration number, and stamp in the top corners of the documents. These are from the Vatican? I asked without even glancing at the contents. I had, of course, handled similar documents over the years and was in no way overawed by the provenance of the documentation. However, owing to my previous encounters with such paperwork, I was acutely aware that the stamp on this particular collection marked them as being both internal and top secret, something which made their current location far from Rome and resting on a street tabletop at a cafe in Istanbul, not only highly suspect, but also fantastically illegal. Eyeing Barrymore carefully and glancing over my shoulder to ensure that we were not being observed, 
I lifted the papers, and having angled them in such a way as to shield them from the view of any passers-by, began to read. After around five minutes, during which I skim-read perhaps five or six pages, I turned my eyes away from the text and back to Barrymore. From the way in which that superior smile danced upon his lips, I could see that the questions and surprise in my eyes had registered and were acknowledged. The documents you are holding cover an incredibly special collection of writings and relate, of course, to an extremely specific subject. They were obtained for me after an exceptionally long period of research by a frustrated priest who seems to have switched allegiances and now crosses himself in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Green. He grinned broadly, clearly having found his own joke highly amusing. By this point, the sun had begun to sink over the Bosporus. The city's skyline of domed mosques and haphazard collections of buildings were bathed in a warm pink light that darkened at its edges into shades of deepening purple. It was, as is typical, a warm and balmy evening, and yet, somehow, even then, there came with that quilting warmth an undercurrent of chill. It reminded me, for a moment, of swimming in the ocean when, stepping or crossing into a new current, one feels, just for a second, an icy stream envelop the legs and arms, a single swirl, gone in moments, that whispers for just a second of the icy depths far from the sun, that lie far, far below. That cold breeze felt for a moment like a warning. The documents represent correspondence between the Holy See and the parishes throughout Europe over the course of almost 220 years. They also specify the locations of relics of immense value. I would like you to retrieve them. I stared once again at the documents and found myself, for one of only a handful of times in my life, entirely speechless. The papers as a collection were indeed records of correspondence, letters, or perhaps more accurately, appeals sent from bishops in locations as disparate as London and the Pyrenees, the island of Malta, and remote parishes in northern Scotland. I was to learn later that these papers, taken as a collection, were commonly referred to as the cri de coeur papers, cries from the heart. In each case, the letter was accompanied by two other documents— a letter from the Vatican in response, and an edict signed by the Pope himself authorizing the use and release of a sacred relic. In each case, a single piece of the betrayer's silver, a Judas penny. The intention behind dispersing these pieces, collected together at such cost of time and money, was to make use of their supposedly magical qualities— In every case documented, in which the bishop of some city had felt the need to write to the Pope personally, the reason for such an appeal was the same, a belief that the parish was being terrorized by a vampire. It seems that each parish that had written to the head of the church had been afflicted by such a creature. Their appeal was for a Judas penny to be sent to the area for use in both exterminating and trapping these fiends, The mythology, so obscure as to be considered by most, including myself, to be irrelevant, goes something like this. Silver, as a purifying metal, was traditionally thought to be used in the destruction of vampires. Whilst it somehow avoided being included in the pages of Stoker's famous novel, the use of silver against vampires was for a long time a very widespread belief, especially across Eastern Europe and some parts of France and Germany. In modern times, this aspect of the vampire legends has been transferred over to werewolves, and is the root from which we get the nonsense about silver bullets. In the period during which these letters were written, however, silver was not considered nonsense, but of the utmost importance. Owing to its proximity to Christ and his story, each Judas penny was considered to have cleansing and indeed magical properties, far beyond that of common silver. The bishops had asked for one to be sent so that it could be used when disposing of the vampire, ensuring that they were dead 
and they requested that the material remain in the parish. The method, once the vampire was disposed of, was to use the silver, melted down, to coat the tip of a stake of around two meters in length. When the vampire's body was buried, often at a crossroads, but sometimes within the cemetery grounds, this stake would be driven through the chest of the corpse, marking the spot and also pinning the now dead creature into its pit. Bound by the silver, particularly silver of such magical providence, the monster would be pinioned like a butterfly fixed to a board and unable to ever rise again. There had long been whispers that the church, during the height of such superstitions, had led a campaign to eradicate vampires from Europe altogether by using this method. Authorizing the distribution of the Judas pennies across the continent in an attempt to kill and indeed trap any and all living examples of these Nosferatu into their resting places. Only now, holding the genuine papers in my hand, did I finally believe that such a covert operation had taken place. I believed that they believed, and became extremely excited by what I read. Now I should say at this point that whilst I now believed that the eradication campaign and redistribution of these valuable artifacts had taken place, when it came to the actual vampires, I had never believed in such things. That, to me, tales of people rising from the dead and drinking blood are just that, tales. Stories that belong in books or at the Saturday matinee. However, this is not to say that I was not interested in the history of vampirism, and particularly in how it intersected with religious history, and the paraphernalia used by believers to rid themselves of their imagined tormentors. Indeed, only a year earlier I had retrieved, from a church in Macau, a jewel-encrusted crozier once thought to have belonged to St. Ignatius, who had reportedly used it to battle demons, and indeed, vampires. Such items were considered rare and of great value. They were extremely collectible, and as a result also immensely expensive. The Judas pennies were already of great value due to their age and their importance to the gospel narratives. The documents Barrymore provided acted as a confirmation of each piece's authenticity, at least in the eyes of the church. If only they could be retrieved, they would be worth a great deal. Add to this the intersection of this myth with folklore of the vampire, and you had an item of immense value. When I asked which of these artifacts Barrymore wished me to seek out, I was taken aback by his response. All of them. Leaning back in his chair, he explained that whilst he would take the individual pieces and pay a considerable sum for each, he would pay ten times the amount for a complete set. Naturally, I understood that a complete set of any item was more valuable than one individual piece separated from the others, but the offer of ten times the figure seemed excessive. I did not argue. Why would I? But Barrymore clearly recognized some inquisitive reflex in my face, for he felt the need to explain. It has long been a belief within my, shall we say, community of friends, that possession of all thirty pieces would grant the possessor eternal life, immortality. It was a mercy granted by Providence that Judas was able to use them to purchase the potter's field, and only after the transaction was complete could he actually end his life. Had he kept the pieces, he would have been cursed to walk the earth in a torment of guilt for all eternity. It is for this reason that the pieces are never kept together in the possession of a single individual, even during their stays in the Vatican. Indeed, there are records and edicts expressly forbidding them from being kept together in one place, that level of power being considered by the clergy to be too much for one individual. Here he again grinned broadly, as if to communicate the fact that he considered himself an individual more than capable of handling such power. Now we have a veritable road map that will allow us to collect all thirty pieces and will grant the possessor that boon, immortality, the chance to avoid death's clutches, and live on, enjoying all that life has to offer indefinitely.
I knew, of course, that simple pieces of silver could grant no such wish. Had I been selling the pieces already in my possession and attached such a price based on such a claim, I would have been laughed at. Here, though, was a ready-made buyer actually offering to pay a massively increased price for a property that the objects did not, <laughs> could not, possess. Again, I was not going to argue. Though, again, as if looking through the front of my head and into my private thoughts, Barrymore addressed the exact thing I was considering. You think me mad. Mad for paying such a price for something that cannot be proven. Perhaps you are right. Barrymore lit another cigarette, and for the first time broke his intense stare, looking away from me and out into the creeping darkness. The money is not just for the items. It is for the work. Dangerous work. He then detailed what he wanted me to do, and, taking no heed of his warnings of danger, I gleefully accepted. Whereas it took Lamentor two decades to collect these relics, it took me only two years. Even then, Barrymore pressed me almost constantly, calling and sending letters, asking for progress reports, restlessly eager to get his hands on the complete collection. I often thought of joking that if the set did indeed grant eternal life or immortality, that he shouldn't be in such a rush. He was obviously going to have plenty of time, but I didn't joke. Instead, I focused on the task at hand, moving from city to city, scouting the area and evaluating the best way and best time to seize the prize. It was not easy work. To dig into a grave that has been settled for centuries requires a lot of exertion, not to mention the difficulties involved in avoiding detection. Some graves, such as the one in Whitby, literally had an iron grate built over the plot, like a sort of cage, just in case the stake of silver weren't enough. In another case, an entire effigy of marble and rock weighing several tons had been erected on and around the spot where the vampire was supposed to have been laid to rest, hardly the sort of thing you can simply run and grab. One location in France was an actual crypt, the body resting inside a sarcophagus with a heavy stone slab atop. This is not to mention the occasions where the description of location did not match what was actually there when I arrived, forcing me to spend several days searching for the correct location before I made any attempt to retrieve the silver. Often, I would be forced to hire help, something which again took time, as I would not only need to vet the individuals to make sure they were capable, but also reliable and discreet. As time went on, Journalists in several newspapers began to notice the pattern and report on the vampire grave robber who was seemingly travelling around Europe and breaking into the final resting grounds of these legendary fiends. Each time one of these reports hit the headlines, I would be forced to lay low, biding my time until the next strike. The reports also had the unfortunate knock-on effect of making the grave owners of parish officials more vigilant so that where they might not have thought about their folkloric site for decades prior, they now decided to keep a more watchful eye, or in some cases, increase security. All of these considerations made retrieval of the artefacts more difficult. However, after only two excavations, I was more than convinced that the effort would be worth it. In both cases, I found silver tipping the edge of a stake that had been driven into the skeleton. In one, through the heart, as you might see in some schlocky hammer horror movie. In the other, through the open mouth of the poor individual accused of such crimes. In all of the time that I was collecting these pieces, the one thing that did not concern me was vampires. Despite having crept around, up to my knees in grave dirt at midnight and having come face to face with almost thirty supposed vampires, I never once felt a chill because of the superstition. To me, these were the bodies of unfortunate people who, owing to the superstition and ignorance of their time, had suffered untimely and often violent deaths. 
Seeing their skeletons, long dead ramshackle collections of bones, I felt no fear except my own ever-present fear of death, a reality one cannot avoid when faced with the fragile remnants of another's life. Aside from the peculiarities of the burial and the violent nature of their deaths, the skeletons were entirely unremarkable, except for being tragic victims of their age. Other than that, they were no different to any other skeleton in the graveyard. That is, except for one. The final grave on my list was the supposed resting place of a Romanian vampire referred to in the legends as Strige. Technically not a name, but a collective noun for something resembling a vampire. Those remains were different. Whether it was some deformity or an abnormality in human development, a species of animal I was not familiar with, or some mixture of the two, animal bones having been buried alongside human remains, I don't know. But what lay in that grave was not your run-of-the-mill corpse. The skull was elongated, with something that looked more like a snout or muzzle, such as you might find on a dog or a horse, in size more like the latter, but in the formation of the teeth more like the former. For, jutting forwards from both segments of the jaw, partially damaged by the insertion of the silver-tipped stake, were fangs. Not the dainty and prettily oversized canines you see in Dracula movies, but jagged, vicious things, the same length and thickness as a man's finger, were this thing to clamp onto the throat, the result would not be pin-prick puncture wounds of Hollywood, but a shredding tear that would rip the flesh to ribbons. For the first and only time, I felt a tightening in my chest and a frosty ripple of fear. Staring into the hollow sockets of this skull, I considered for a moment whether I might be able to also take this with me as a prize— Surely some collector would pay a handsome price for such a curious artifact. I reasoned, however, that trying to sell such an item might cause more complications than it was worth, linking me, as it would, to the other acquisitions. Beyond that, there was also something else. Unlike the other skulls, the many hollow remnants I had encountered during this grisly endeavour, this skull seemed somehow to stare back. It was an uncomfortable feeling, akin in some ways to the sensation of weight pressing on the chest or shoulders. I decided to remove the stake and leave the rest in situ. Doing so was easier said than done, and I cursed more than once with the effort of dislodging the blasted thing. Once I finally had, and the silver tip was secure inside my satchel, I walked the few minutes back to where I had parked the hire car, with the intention of making as speedy an exit as I could. To this day, I have never forgotten the sound of the scream that rang out into the night, the curdling, wrenching yelp from somewhere behind me, back amongst the trees, through the lines of graves, and I suspected from within the hollow of that pit. I delivered the pieces, all thirty, to Barrymore three weeks later. In the first fortnight, while still in Romania, I could not ignore the reports on the news of disappearances, including one of a young man found mauled. Initially it was thought by dogs. By the third week, I was out of the country and beyond the reach of that local news, able, for a while at least, to ignore the reports and what they might imply about my actions. The actual handing over to Barrymore was actually rather anticlimactic. I had placed the thirty pieces into a small display case, divided into thirty small segments. Handing it over to Barrymore, I was somewhat disappointed when he lifted the ashtray from the table and smashed the glass of the case, fishing out the pieces along with shards of splintered glass like someone committing a smash-and-grab at a jewellery store. He greedily transferred the pieces from the case into a small leather pouch, and, abruptly standing, quizzed me furiously. This is all of them? All thirty? I nodded, reflecting that had he taken the time to count them he might have seen how many individual pieces there were. 
and they are from the places listed, exactly the places listed, these need to be the genuine article. It is imperative that they are genuine. He spat the words with a mixture of forceful declaration, and beneath it at least a small hint of desperation. Again I nodded, rising from my seat to mirror his actions. In that case, he said with a sigh, the money will be with you by the end of the week. With that he turned and walked away. I did not see him again until just over a year ago. When I next saw Barrymore, over thirty years later, he was lying in a hospital bed, and not only did he not look like himself, but he also looked like no human being I have ever seen alive. The previous day I had received a phone call from the hospital saying that a man named Barrymore had listed me as his next of kin, and that he was desperate to see me. The doctor added that if I did wish to see him, that it might be best to get here sooner rather than later. I will admit that I had no great desire to see Barrymore. Three decades of strange nightmares had made me somewhat regret having worked for him in the first place. But the phrase, next of kin, and what that might imply about Barrymore's last will and testament, implored me to visit him. I can say, happily, that I have never seen a vampire. The closest I have ever come to seeing the undead was that day when I saw Truman Barrymore. Even before I stepped onto the ward, the doctor in attendance warned me to prepare myself. He explained that Barrymore had been found several weeks earlier, barely alive by sewer workers. He had been lying, naked and almost entirely drained of blood, in a section of sewer close to London Bridge. I don't know when you last saw Mr. Barrymore, but I feel I should tell you to prepare yourself. He is in a bad way. I have no idea how long he has been down there and away from the sunlight, but whatever he has been doing has had a terrible effect upon his body. When the police and paramedics brought him in, he had lost so much blood he was virtually on the point of death, but his other issues are far more long-term. His musculature has almost entirely atrophied, as if he has been in a state of paralysis for many years. He is severely emaciated, almost to the point of starvation, and though he had some fresh injuries when he was brought in, he also has some very severe scarring from injuries suffered over a much longer period. I am not sure what happened to your friend, and he won't tell us, but whatever it was, he may not have long left. I nodded, shrinking a little from the doctor's use of the word friend in relation to Barrymore, and stepped onto the ward. People often use the phrase, a shadow of his former self, when referring to a drastic and negative change in an individual's appearance. In Barrymore's case, the metaphor would be inaccurate. His former shadow had more weight and substance to it than the pitiful fragment I saw before me. His cheeks were almost hollow, his eyes bulging, emphasized by the skull-like emptiness of the sockets. He looked, for all the world, like a skeleton onto which someone had painted a skin in a yellowy shade of not quite white. What struck me the most, however, were his teeth. For across both rows, Barrymore's entire set of teeth were made of silver. Silver for which I was sure I could name the source. For some god-awful reason, he had had the metal of the Judas pennies shaped into teeth and fitted into his own jaw. Perhaps, I thought, as a way of keeping all thirty pieces together in one place and achieving the immortality he so craved. Though, I reflected even then, if this were the life he was to live eternally, perhaps he would be better off dead. When he saw me, Barrymore burst into tears. Eventually, once he had settled himself sufficiently, he began to speak. What he told me made my blood run cold. It worked, he began. The Judas pieces, having them together, it gave me what I asked for. I cannot be killed. I cannot die. I stared at him, considering that in his current state he could be proven wrong at any second. He came for me in the first month. You see, he knew I couldn't die. 
that no matter how many times he fed upon me, no matter how many times he sucked and drained me dry, I would awake the following day ready to provide him with another meal. What better food source for an immortal predator than an immortal prey? I stared at the thick, leathery knot of scar tissue that extended from his jawline to the top of his chest, as if something had taken a power tool to his neck and throat, realizing, as I did, that the new wounds the doctor had spoken of seemed almost to have healed. Thirty-three years. Thirty-three years dragged from one subterranean hovel to another, stored in his dark larders like a fly entombed in a web, waiting alive and horribly awake for the spider's return. At this he opened his hand as fresh tears streamed and trickled down the jagged precipice of his cheeks. They found me and pulled me out, but he won't let me go. I am his bride now, his to feast upon, forever, unless I can die. I looked down and saw in his palm a chunk of silver one end of which was attached to a dry and gelatinous mass of what looked like blood speckled with fragments of bone. There were scratches and dents in the silver where the gripping bite of pliers had been. Take this. Perhaps if the thirty are no longer together, perhaps then the curse will be broken. Perhaps then I can die. I lifted the silver nugget from his hand. I have left you everything, my entire fortune, in exchange for the promise. You will never again, for as long as you are alive, allow these thirty pieces to be together in one place. Never. I promised, and was about to add something, when Barrymore lost consciousness, and the machines to which he was attached shrieked into life. A hustle of doctors and nurses rushed into the room, and I was bundled out of the door, still holding the silver tooth in one hand. When I returned to the hospital the following day, the doctor met me with a face the color of ash. As he spoke, his lip trembled. He told me that, somehow, Barrymore had gone missing. Though he was unable to stand unaided, he had somehow gone from the hospital without discharging himself. The doctor was unsure as to what exactly had happened, but I could, if I wanted, speak to the nurse who was working the shift, though he could not promise that I would get much sense from him either. The doctor said these last words whilst looking very deeply into my eyes, as if trying to both communicate some truth and extract some confirmation of that truth from me. Eventually, satisfied that I could at least guess what he was referring to, he looked away, and pointed me in the direction of the nurse. The nurse, who had been on shift, was now in a bed on the ward himself, having injured his head after fainting. He was being treated for concussion, and had apparently not spoken much in the way of sense in the hours since his fall. I nevertheless decided to speak to him to find out what he could tell me about Barrymore's disappearance. To this day, I really wish I hadn't. All he kept repeating were the same few sentences, staring straight forward and seemingly unable to add any greater detail. All he would say was, It just took him. It came through the window and just dragged him from the bed. I tried to help him, but it had him. It just, it shook him like a dog with a chew toy or a rag or something. He was just lying there, dead, limp, and it, it just dragged him off and disappeared out of the window. There was nothing I could do. He dragged him off and they disappeared. There was nothing I could do. Looking at him, sitting bolt upright in bed, staring into the middle distance, muttering the same words over and over, I believed him. A few weeks later, I was contacted by a solicitor acting upon Barrymore's instruction that if he were to disappear, the will should come into effect. I became the sole benefactor and recipient of Barrymore's fortune. I used the money to open the Onga Slate Curiosity Museum, where I have kept the tooth ever since. For the remainder of my life, I shall endeavour to ensure that it is never reunited with the other twenty-nine pieces, hoping, as I do, that they have been scattered to the four winds, and are not, as I fear, 
still rooted to the jaw of the creature's favorite victim. Whether this separation will break the curse and allow Barrymore the rest and peace he rejected in life I do not know, but I doubt it. Because whatever it was that came for him certainly didn't think so. The Gawkers Though it is true that I had been waiting, it's also true that I had never quite known exactly what I was waiting for. It was only when I saw that photograph in the newspaper, the one that the photographer had tastelessly titled The Gawkers, that I really, truly understood what had happened and began to live in fear of when it might happen again. For most people, the 12th of February 2021 was just another day. Admittedly, the circumstances around the coronavirus and the restrictions that came with it meant that this 12th of February would be somewhat different to the same date in 2019 or pretty much any year prior, but in the context of the week, month, and year in which it quietly lurked, it was, for most people, no different than the day that came before it or after. Unlike me, most people will not have been anticipating the date, partially looking forward to and partly dreading it, and in fact would never have known or even suspected there was anything remotely special or significant about it. Though, of course, there was. If you were to ask most people in the street what they were doing on that day, only a few weeks ago they most likely would not be able to tell you, except that in certain parts of the world it would probably have involved a stretching continuation of their current lockdown situation. You could, for example, ask yourself right now, do you know exactly what you did on the 12th of February? Did you attach any great significance to that date? Were you waiting in anxious expectation of it rolling around? Probably not. For me, though, it was different. I had been living in fear of this date for almost fifteen years. I had marked the days on my calendar, set up countdown timers to that date on computers that didn't make it even halfway to the day before needing to be replaced with a new computer and another new countdown. The notches in my bedpost did not signify lovers who had shared it with me or record my trysts and conquests. Instead, they marked the days that passed since I started counting down to that date. In recent years, I had researched the possible significance of the 12th of the 2nd, 2021, from every conceivable angle. The date became my obsession, and once it had passed, my horror. For those who completely missed it, it might be worth mentioning that 1202-2021, written in the way that dates are recorded in the UK, with the day before the month, is both a palindrome and an ambigram. It's a palindrome because it could be read exactly the same backwards as forwards, in the same way the phrase Madam I'm Adam can be. It's an ambigram because it is exactly the same, at least on a digital display, when seen the right way up or upside down. So, whether you read the number backwards or forwards, right way up or upside down, it looks the same. So far, so BuzzFeed. This strange quirk of numbers may seem to hold some deeper significance to some, and trust me, for many years I believed it probably did, but it doesn't, at least not in and of itself. Over the last decade, I have consulted everyone, from crank numerologists to respected mathematicians, trying to decode what significance could lie behind this odd formation. From the former group, the answer was some hogwash about the date being deeply auspicious and a time for beginnings and endings to meet. Whilst from the decidedly more rational latter group, the answer was simpler and more direct. Numerical coincidence and counting. Whilst it certainly did seem a coincidence to me that this date should have such interesting qualities, the significance was somewhat undermined by the fact that the people who gave me a reason to find the date significant in the first place could not possibly have been aware of it, either because they would never have seen a digital clock, would never have written the date in this manner, or because they did not even follow the same calendar. Yet, they all clearly knew the number, and they all knew that date.
I should explain at this point that 1202-2021 was not significant to me because of the quirks of its arrangement. I am far from being a mathematician, and even further from being a numerologist, whatever that even means. What I am is a historian. Whilst dates are naturally an important part of my job, a date as a number, by itself, is meaningless. It is the events and circumstances surrounding the dates, rather than the numbers themselves, that interest me. What I do share with numerologists and mathematicians, however, is an eye for patterns. For them, a pattern is formed of digits. For me, it is formed from incidents and occurrences, incidents that sometimes happen to involve incredibly special numbers. The first incident that brought this particular date to my attention was during my preparations for a class on the history of crime and punishment in medieval England, a topic that the squeamish amongst you might want to gloss over. The particular form of punishment that I was investigating, reserved for those guilty of treason, was the process of being hung, drawn, and quartered. Nowadays, this collection of words is used metaphorically to describe someone being verbally eviscerated or taken to task, A politician, for example, might be hung, drawn, and quartered by a particularly incisive interviewer or an opposition politician. We might complain that a particular celebrity has been hung, drawn, and quartered by the media if we felt that they had been unfairly victimised. Historically, however, the process had a much grislier and far more literal meaning. To be hung, drawn, and quartered was much like it sounded, Technically, the name somewhat confuses the order, as the criminal would usually be attached to the back of a cart pulled by horses and dragged, or drawn, through the city, before the hanging took place. At the agreed point for execution, the criminal would then be hanged, not in the way that victims were executed, by a long drop in order to break the neck and kill them almost instantly, but instead strung up and slowly strangulated, to the point that their tongue turned blue, and they were incapacitated but not actually expired. At this point, the victim was considered close enough to death to be somewhat anaesthetized and only semi-conscious. This was in some ways a mercy. The final stage, the quartering, actually involved far more than simply cutting the accused body into four pieces. First, they would have their genitals removed. They would then be eviscerated, having their innards removed, after which they would be beheaded, and then finally have their body split into four parts, though one imagines that by this point the victim would no longer be paying much attention. As legend has it, Guy Fawkes, the infamous leader of the gunpowder plot to blow up Parliament, after whose face the anonymous masks you see at every protest were fashioned, was hung, drawn, and quartered. However, in what would become an illustrative lesson in the dangers of trying to be a smartass, he attempted to deprive his captors the satisfaction of torturing him by throwing himself from the platform of the gallows. This was an attempt to break his own neck and die instantly. Unfortunately for the devious Mr. Fawkes, the consequence of his leap from the platform was that the rope attached to his neck snapped. Rather than taking away the executioner's chance to torture him then, Fawkes instead deprived himself of the hanging process that would have rendered him semi-conscious. He was therefore fully awake and screaming when the dismemberment and removal of vital organs took place, the newly detached parts being held up for him to observe at each stage until he finally died, in agony. Whilst this possibly apocryphal tale would seem to be about as grim as this element of history could get, there is another example that vies closely with it for that title. It was this example in particular that first pinned my obsessions to that date less than a month ago. That example, which the curious can research for themselves, is known as the double death of Arthur Turner. Turner, who, like Fawkes, was convicted of high treason and subsequently sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered, went to his first death far more quietly. The process was followed exactly as it was with every other execution, and, after having been emasculated and relieved of his bowels, it was thought that Turner was dead. However, witnesses at the time described that just as the beheading was about to take place, the body of Turner abruptly sat bolt upright and, screaming in pain, opened its eyes. 
So surprised by this was the executioner that he hesitated and took a step back, just long enough for the spectators to hear Turner announce that, This isn't me. It isn't me. I'm not meant to be here. This isn't me. Holding his axe limply by his side and watching this hollowed-out and blue-tongued wreck of a human carcass speaking, the executioner bade him to be silent, to which Turner responded by saying only that, this is wrong. This, it's the wrong day. Today is February the 12th, 2021. This isn't me. With that, the axe fell, and silence resumed. There are several overlapping versions of this story. Some have the body attempting to claw its way off the platform. Others still have the conversation taking place after the removal of the head. In every account, however, the final words before Turner's second death are recorded the same. Today is February the 12th, 2021. The only other strange detail about the story is that in every account it is noted that when the body sat up, the entire surface of its eyes, including the iris and the sclera, the whites of the eye, had turned entirely black. For most, this curious little tale is just that, a quirky story to share with students that held little more significance than being a strange and gruesome story. Where it begins to become more interesting is when you consider the others. A month after having read about this odd tale, I had all but forgotten about it until, that was, I entered a particular dungeon room I had arranged to visit in the northern English city of York. Much like London, the city of York once housed facilities built and operated for the sole purpose of punishing and torturing the most notorious criminals of the time. Indeed, visitors to either city today can actually explore these dungeons, which have now been repackaged as a lurid tourist attraction that exists in some strange hinterland between being a museum and a live-action ghost train. Filled with grotesque waxworks and animatronics, as well as actors in costume, the dungeons are essentially a guided tour through the more gruesome elements of Britain's rather barbaric past. I have visited both the York and London dungeons, and found them to be not only very entertaining, but on the whole, quite historically accurate. It was, however, to a lesser known and certainly less visited dungeon that I had ventured, having been granted special permission by the university. This network of stone rooms beneath the ground and around a quarter mile from the famous York Minster was made all the more striking for me by the graffiti etched into the wall of one of the cells. From floor to ceiling, carved into the thick stone walls over and over, was the figure 12022021, separated with slashes in a way that made the number look as if it had been written as a date, the 12th of February, 2021. Investigating the listed occupants of the dungeon and the cell itself, I found that the strange etchings had been made by a prisoner named Watt Merchant. Merchant had been accused of robbing and killing several members of the clergy, and was hunted throughout the city of York and the surrounding counties for a number of weeks. When the authorities finally caught up with him, he holed himself up in a nearby cottage and committed suicide by drinking a poison made of nightshade. It was decided by the authorities that this act of suicide, coupled with some of the items found on Merchant's person, amounted to an admission of guilt and it was declared that he would be found posthumously guilty, and that his body was to be mounted on a pike from the city walls, as an example to others. As it happened, and in a strange echo of the story of Arthur Turner, what Merchant allegedly sprang back to life before he could be mounted on a pike. Realising that he was alive and that they would therefore need to go through the inconvenience of holding a trial before they executed him, the authorities decided to imprison Merchant and subsequently threw him into the dungeons. Once inside, and despite the fact that he appeared to have been rendered both dumb and blind by the poison, his eyes had taken on a jet-black colour. He spent the time simply inscribing this number over and over into the walls of his cell. Merchant was executed a week later, and as planned, his body was mounted on the city walls, in six separate pieces. Intrigued by the similarities between the two stories, the double deaths, the gruesome executions, the blackening of the eyes, and in particular the presence of the exact 
same number, I decided to explore the topic further, investigating whether this strange number turned up in any other contexts, in other historical events or legends. Little did I know what a can of worms I was about to open. Over the past fifteen years, this passing interest, based initially more on a macabre curiosity than any serious thought towards historical investigation, has developed into a full-blown obsession. In this time, I have collected seventy-four separate incidents in which the figure 120220021 features prominently. They come from all across the globe and share a number of common features. In every single example, there is either some remarkably close-to-death experience, or, as far as those involved are concerned, an actual death and resurrection. In every single case, this incident is followed by a blackening of the eyes, and in every single case, the number, or what I came to understand as the date, 1202-2021, played some significant part. Mala Feeney an Irish woman whom I met in 2018, was pronounced dead after a major heart attack in 1999. She had initially been taken to hospital with chest pains early in the morning, and had suffered a fatal cardiac arrest whilst on the operating table. She was pronounced dead and taken to the mortuary. After lying on the slab, lifeless, for seven hours, Mala simply got up, left the mortuary, and was found wandering disoriented around one of the hospital corridors. Her eyes had turned completely black, and she never spoke again. I was alerted to Marla's case by a psychologist friend of mine, who had heard of my burgeoning obsession with that particular number. It turned out that my fascination paled in comparison to Marla's. She would sit for hours in the home, tearing sheets of paper into strips until there were four piles, twelve, two, twenty, and twenty-one. She did the same with coins, and the small piles of pounds and pence were left all over her room in formations that amounted to this figure. A ten and two pence piece, a two, twenty individual pound coins, and a twenty pence piece with a penny, over and over again. Everything in Marla's house was arranged according to this number. Her cutlery drawer had exactly twelve knives, two forks, twenty spoons, and twenty-one teaspoons. Every book on her shelf had either twelve, two, twenty, or twenty-one pages. She would remove all the others and throw them away, then arrange the books in order on the shelves so that they made the correct figure. Marla had never spoken since her experience, but had once spent a week signing her name over and over into a notebook. On each page, she signed the name fifty-five times, in a formation of twelve signatures, then below two signatures, twenty and twenty-one. What was particularly odd about this was the fact that the signature did not match anything she had signed prior to her heart attack, and was not even her own name. Marla died, possibly for a second time, in late 2020. Until recently, in Arkansas in the United States, a man named Ridgely Alderton was serving life in prison for having murdered four people, two young adults and two children, whose ages, by this point, I would assume you could guess. Alderton is a somewhat striking-looking man, on account of having the date 12.02.2021 tattooed across his body in every conceivable way and at every conceivable angle. What is even more striking is that until 2014, Alderton was an accountant, with a wife and children who had never had a criminal record and, as far as most were concerned, had never committed a violent act or even a crime of any description in his life. Not until, that is, in 2001, when, swimming in a local river, he got into difficulty and drowned, before miraculously coming back to life an hour later in the back of an ambulance and inside a body bag. Alderton, who never spoke again and had severe damage to his eyes, later abandoned his wife and family, became obsessed with tattooing that particular figure onto his skin, before going on the aforementioned killing spree. In 2014, I wrote an article about this phenomenon, the various occurrences and the strange recurring details that were widely published. On February the 12th of the following year, I awoke to find a pile of letters awaiting me on the doormat. None of the letters had a return address, 
but judging by the handwriting, they seemed to have come from the same person. Each large brown envelope was stuffed, almost to bursting point, with photocopies of newspaper clippings, extracts from books, and in some cases a mixture of both, glued to backboards and written in languages I could not read, with handwritten translations in English pasted on a card next to them. Each envelope was, in and of itself, a case file covering yet another example of this strange phenomenon, thoroughly researched with examples and sources. Clearly, I was not the only person to be somewhat obsessed with this date, and whoever was compiling this information wanted me to see it. I read of a woman in Mexico known as Black-Eyed Lena. At the age of 63, she had been killed when a stray bullet fired during a dispute between rival gangs flew through her living room window and passed through her chest. She was declared dead at the scene. Despite this inconvenient fact, Lena refused to remain dead, and indeed insisted upon dying for the second time in 2018. By yet another strange miracle and resurrection, Lena had woken up as her body was being transported to the funeral home. Though she never spoke again, she did write both clearly and prolifically. Curiously, however, she did not write in her native Spanish, but in French, a language she had never studied, nor, as far as her family knew, understood. Lena insisted that the funeral arrangements that had been made for her go ahead with the family burying a marionette dressed up to look like Lena. The photographs from a Mexican newspaper showed Lena, wearing dark glasses and kitted out all in black, standing before colourful explosions of flowers at what was ostensibly her funeral. Though she was referred to as Black-Eyed Lena following the incident, and on account of her oracular peculiarities, Lena insisted on being referred to as Margot by her family, and would write over and over again in huge capital letters, scoring the lines into the paper in frustration that Lena is dead. She would also repeatedly insist that she herself needed to die before February the 12th, 2021, a date that she would scribble into her notebooks over and over again. Another story, The Two-Day Girl, told of a man who had succumbed to lung cancer in a northern province of China sometime in the late 19th century, only to come back from the dead and for two days speak fluently in English. According to the legend, not only did this man come back from the dead and speak for two days in a language that neither he nor his family understood, but he did so in a woman's voice. The only thing that she would say in her native tongue was the numbers 12, 02, 20, and 21, which she repeated in sequence over and over. A similar story recorded in Italy in the early years of the 20th century had the added twist that the resurrected individual, a man named Etienne, made a number of predictions, outlining events that would take place during the 20th century, including the World Wars, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the moon landing, and the rise and assassination of JFK, before expiring for a second time. The first time I received these packages, in 2015, there were 11 envelopes. The following year, there were 17. The number increased every year, and never at any point did I have any idea who was sending me this evidence. On February the 12th, 2020, the trend changed. I received only two envelopes. One contained an example from the 17th century and told of a woman named Mary Shuttler, who had died and was buried in Devon in England, only to awake two weeks later in her coffin. How this could be possible was not explained. What was outlined, however, was how Mary clawed her way back to the surface and staggered, listlessly, back into town. Caked in mud, her eyes as perfectly black as the surface of an eight-ball, she reached the local tavern and, beating on the door, screamed over and over again that same infamous date. She was eventually shot and killed by a local merchant who declared her to be a vampire. Her body was reburied outside the churchyard, on unconsecrated ground. The second envelope was different from all of the others. It contained a letter addressed directly to me. Attached were photographs of a woman with obsidian eyes, 
In the letter, she explained that she was writing to me from a secure ward somewhere in Arizona, in the United States of America. The letter writer had been committed to the ward in 2014 and had lived there, under close supervision, ever since. She explained that according to everyone else at the facility, in 2012, she had suffered a massive stroke and died. She also explained, somewhat cryptically, that the reason for her being committed to the ward was her insistence that the person who had expired in this body was someone else. Over and over the letter writer repeated that she wished she could explain that she could tell me what I had stumbled across and what was about to happen, but to do so would cause a tear and endanger everyone, and she was not willing to do that. She signed off by saying that, of course, the day would come, and once the 12th of the 2nd, 2021, had arrived, I would have my answer. For the next 12 months, I saw the number everywhere, and as the days counted down to that very particular and peculiar date, I began to become more and more anxious. I found myself willing time to speed up, not only counting down the days, but watching the clock, wishing away the hours, the minutes, until the day would finally arrive and whatever was going to happen, would happen. On the 11th of February, 2021, I did not sleep. As many around the world had done just over a month earlier, I stayed up to count down to midnight. I was alone in my home, watching the clock, a glass of whiskey by my elbow, wondering what exactly was about to take place, and I'll admit that as the final ten seconds neared, I did feel a very real flash of fear. Midnight finally came. I entered onto the 12th of the 2nd, 2021, quietly and alone. Nothing happened. The following morning, I woke incredibly early and waited in anticipation of the morning post, expecting a deluge of envelopes. All I received was a bill. I scoured news channels all day looking for some great event, some significant world-shaking incident that was going to mark this date in the memories of mankind for centuries to come. Nothing. To say that I was disappointed isn't quite right. The same part of me that had twisted my stomach into a knot of fear as the clock approached midnight the previous evening was relieved that the day had come and gone without incident, but I must admit that I had anticipated the day for so long I did feel a certain hollow sadness that the significance I had attached to the day had come to naught, or so I assumed. On the 14th of February, I received not a Valentine's card, but a brown envelope, the front of which was adorned with a familiar script. Inside there was no letter, but there was a series of photographs and a newspaper cutting. The cutting concerned the escape from a secure unit in Arizona of an elderly woman, and appealed for any information relating to her whereabouts. The photographs, 28 in total, and each labelled at the bottom with a date extending from November of 2020 to January 2021, showed a right hand in various increasing stages of what seemed to be decomposition. At first the hand looked just a little off-colour, then it seemed bloated, yellowed, and greyish. As the dates of the photographs got closer to the present, the hand withered at a speed I knew was far quicker than general decomposition. It blackened, began to flake and deteriorate, the flesh putrefying and seeming to slide and ooze off the bones in thick, syrupy piles. Disturbing as these photographs were, it was the final photograph that turned my stomach. It was, I assumed, the same woman who had written to me the previous year, the one responsible for sending the envelopes full of evidence. Now, however, she was no longer a woman, or it seemed to me even still living. The same black eyes stared out from the photograph, but there were gaps. Much of the body seemed to have rotted and withered away in the same way as the featured hand, but at some points there seemed to be simply holes. Gaps and spaces where there was no decomposition, but simply nothing. On the right of her head, for example, there was a huge semicircular space through which the wall behind could be seen. The person taking the photograph, a Polaroid selfie, was holding up a hand that seemed to be entirely transparent. It was as if the hand attached to the wrist was made of glass or ice, 
and had flecks and fragments of dead leaves still stuck to it, though rather than leaves, the small scraps of blackened detritus were remnants of flesh. I put away the photographs, unsure of what the hell I had been looking at. It would be another week before I found what I thought might be an answer. The Gawkers is a photograph taken on the 12th of February 2021 by award-winning photographer Marc Lamond. It is the only photograph taken of a particularly singular incident that took place on that much-repeated date, but of which the media did not become aware until a week later. The photograph shows rows and rows of individuals, all sitting straight-backed on plastic chairs in a church hall in Maine, in America. Every individual is staring forwards, their eyes completely black and their mouths hanging open, as if they are gawking at something taking place before them. These 77 people were found in this state on the 12th of February 2021, and were all members of a particular religious sect that some might ungenerously term a cult. The story has been suppressed, but reports can be found online by those keen to investigate the incident further. The individuals in the church hall were all found to be alive in that their hearts were still beating, but they were contrastingly clinically brain dead. They had come to the church hall to attend an event claiming to provide a collective experience of past life regression. The literature for the event, which involved some form of mass hypnosis, claimed that attendees would be guided through a process that would allow them to experience their past lives, enabling them to enter the bodies of, and see through the eyes of, their former selves. Though, of course, I have no way of proving what I think happened, nor any explanation of the mechanisms by which it would take place, I do have some suspicions. What if, I have wondered, these individuals were indeed taken back, successfully supplanted into their past lives, but rather than coexisting with their previous selves in their past incarnations, they instead inhabited their former bodies just after the point of death. What if the person screaming from the disemboweled corpse was right when he said, this isn't me, that what he really meant was that he was from another time, that his consciousness had been supplanted into this body from centuries earlier, leaving his current body vacated, limp, and virtually lifeless, gawking into the night. Was it possible that their souls had somehow moved from their bodies and their modern-day setting into bodies they had previously inhabited centuries or decades earlier? Was it also possible that this process could only be completed once the previous life was finished? Would that explain why some spoke in languages they had not previously known? Why could some of them predict future events? I thought again of the photographs I had been sent, of how most of the incidents I had read about, the past lives, were indeed far in the past, but considered also how it was entirely possible that one might be far more recent. I wondered what might happen if a soul from the present moved into a past life that occurred only in the past few decades, and of course, what might happen if the past life eventually approached the date on which the body of its current life was vacated, the date upon which it was sent back, 12.02.2021. I do not pretend to know how this could be possible. Whether the palindromic nature of the date had anything to do with its presumably magical qualities or not, what I do know is that whilst I read dates in the day, month, and year format, if you read by the American method of the month, day, and year, there will be nine consecutive days that are five-digit palindromes in December of 2021. One of these dates will be an eight-digit palindrome that will read 12.02.2021. It's a date I am not looking forward to. This has been Five Short Horror Stories for Adults, written by Stories from the Attic, narrated by Robin McConnell, copyright 2021 by Michael Vandervoort, production copyright by Michael Vandervoort.